and welcome on another amazing safari live experience here in the middle of the African bush where we get up to all kinds of crazy, wonderful and expected things. We've had a sunset and sunrise safaris filled with lions, leopards and all kinds of magical creatures and this afternoon we are starting with something a little different. My name is Jamie, the man behind the camera is Dave and this is Sundile's leopard scat because this is Safari Live. Once again, and as I said, this is the Sunset Safari, and here on Safari Live, we do all kinds of unexpected things. And we're starting off our Sunset Safari by collecting what I know to be Sundile's leopard scat, the byproduct of his digestive process, and popping it into this well prepared vial. And I'll explain why we're doing that in a moment, but let us see if we can get to this method because I think we might have a slight problem here. It's gone a bit solid in the sun. And I'm not quite sure how we're going to fit this into this leopard scat tube. I will explain everything in a moment. It will all make total sense in a couple of seconds. We have a slight problem here, Dave. Wait, okay. Now the one thing that we're always very careful with in terms of what we do is picking up a predator scat. This is the dung or scat of a leopard, a male leopard to be exact. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> It's all gone wrong. Okay. I don't really want to touch it, so let's see if we can... No? Not so much. Would you like to look at a leopard track while I attempt to break open the leopard scat, or shall we just carry on with this painful experience? That is a leopard track over there, and I'm going to explain some things, a little bit about how it works. So we are here live on Juma, Arethusa, and Cheetah Plains Game Reserves in the Sabi Sand in the Greater, Nas Greater, Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. And not only are we live, but we're also interactive, which means that you can send through your questions. Like, for example, if you were curious as to why I'm collecting a pile of leopard scat, you can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. I'm going to try and figure this out. I need a rock, which is mostly quite a difficult process in the Sabi Sands. I'm not quite sure how on earth we're going. Where's that pile? Oh, there. Okay, I'm going to make this work. I'm going to make it work. Come on. It's got like cement. Oh no, I nearly touched it. Aha! I've hit upon a better method. Here we go. Much better. My homemade chopsticks, which are very, very ineffective. And hey, we have lift off a perfectly preserved leopard scat in a, oh, it smells, oof, I'm so sorry I opened that up, oof. <laughs> so here we have it, a vial full of leopard scat and for a very, very valuable reason. So what we do is we hand this over to a fantastic organization called Panthera, who's using it to do DNA tests into the different leopards of the area. And that means anything from, well, especially focused on the paternity of the different leopards, because, of course, that is always something a little bit uncertain. And then also just general genetic studies and interesting facts that we could find out about the leopard. Now, we have collected Sindile scats before, but we've been very especially asked to go and get this particular pile, hence my determination to break it apart and fit it into the vial. And Dave doesn't have a pen on him. I have come highly prepared and I don't have a pen on me either. But I doubt I'm going to forget which particular leopard I took this from. And let me play, put that down for one moment. I did tell a story recently of how I accidentally forgot about one of the vials, or somebody forgot about one of the vials, and Brent and myself found it in our sock box not too long ago. But there we have it. Sample collected. The only thing I will need to do quickly 
is mark the GPS point. Let me move my head. So what I'm going to do when I actually have a pen is write down who collected it, so the collector, the date at which it was collected, and now I just need to mark the GPS coordinates so that we know. And there we have it. Leopard DNA on tap, or at least in vial. And of course we've had the most incredible days recently. I'm just going to mark my GPS quickly. We most had the most incredible drives. Yesterday we saw 26 different big cats. This morning we saw five different leopards. And this afternoon, fingers crossed, is going to promise to be equally exciting. You'll just have to stay tuned and see what it is we find on this afternoon's sunset safari. Which would be very nice if my map would find where I am. Oh, there we go. And pin. Perfect. There we go. GPS coordinate marked. Right, Dave, shall we go now? Yes. We've finished with our messy business of the leopard excrement breaking apart. I think we can move on. It's rather blisteringly hot out here in the sun. 28 degrees it is this afternoon. Okie dokie, let's try not to drive over it, although that ship has already sailed for some hapless person who came driving around and drove over that. And off we go back to where we were this morning. So this morning we had Karula and her two lovely cubs with an impala kill. I'll wait till you see it. If you've missed it or if you've missed the screenshots, I have to tell you that it's probably one of Karula's most impressive feats of strength that I've seen to date. Our female leopard managed to pull an entire impala about 10 meters straight up into a straight tree without any branches that she could grab onto. It must, I mean, it must weigh the same amount as she does. Oh, goodness. This could be quite interesting, Dave. Hold on tight. Watch heads, everybody. This is quite the drop we've got here. Here we go. Perfect. And off we go. So Dave and myself are going to head across to Karula. I know that James's plan was to follow up on Tingana and Shadow, who were mating not more than 300 yards from where Karula was. Let's go and find out how his search for them is going. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this end of the Sunset Safari. You'll be very pleased to know that our search has been extremely fruitful. Now, where we're sitting here, it wasn't particularly difficult, I have to tell you, because Herbert came in here first and found them. Uh, but just beyond here, you will see the spots of two leopards, as found or spotted the second time round by Jean Dre, who is on camera today. Hello, Jean Dre. Hello, James. Yes, and say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. Wonderful to have you with us. Now, this is rather a joy because there are leopards everywhere you look. Three of them, just as Jamie says, 300 meters to the west of where we are, east of where we are now. And we are going to spend some time with Shadow and Tingana and try and work out f the psychology behind what is going on with young Shadow. Let's go and have a look. Please do talk to us. We love to hear from you. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. I didn't see these leopards. Jandre managed to spot them first. Uh, this is a wonderful scene, mainly because it is so wonderfully exemplifies what happens when leopards are mating. You have a situation where the male is absolutely exhausted, and the female, I'm going to just talk quite quietly now as she watches us move in here, the female in a state of abject frustration. And she's growling at him. Look, 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 look. Isn't this amazing, everyone? that so often or we see it relatively often and it is the most amazing thing every single time
so cool. Hmm. And he, that's him growling, you can maybe hear him. Now what is going on here? If you are maybe a new viewer, let me just give you a bit of background here. That is Tingana. He is nine years old, he must be pushing ten by now, but a nine-year-old male leopard of this area. He is the dominant male leopard, his uh, sort of regency is unchallenged in this area. And he roams over the territories of Shadow, who's this female here, her sister Tandi, and indeed their mother Karula. And possibly some others to the north, like Shiluva, for example. To the left-hand side is the female, that is Shadow. She is also nine, must be also pushing ten by this stage. And she has a very interesting and quite sad story. Unlike her mother, who has raised eight cubs now, Shadow, in her nine years, has failed to raise one cub to adulthood and independence. And I think we're witnessing the reason for that. I think this mystery was almost solved the last time she had a cub, and now it's being solved because we know she does have a cub who is six months as of pretty much today. Now, what's interesting is that she is, for six, a six-month-old cub's mother, to be mating again now, to be in full estrus, which it looks like she is, is not right. Well, it's not right in that normally they only come into estrus when their cubs become semi-independent or almost completely independent. In the case of a female leopard, that has been recorded at eight months. In the case of a male, very unusually before 14 or 15 months will the male go completely independent. So the fact that her cub is only six months old and she's mating again, I think is indicative of a hormonal imbalance in her body where she comes into estrus too quickly after her last cub and I think that is why she's lost so many cubs. In the case of her last cub, Sindile, a young male leopard, we all thought that he was going to have a horrible time because he was kidnapped. Well, he wasn't kidnapped. He was taken and put in rehab after he caught a, a domestic dog. Now, he was about, I think he was 10 months old when that happened, and that was a bit of a disaster. We thought that was it. Normally, they put leopards down if they do that, but in this case, they took him and put him in a rehabilitation center and brought him back after seven or eight months. He's now an independent leopard. One wonders if that would have been the case had he stayed with her, because she was already starting to mate with another male, uh, well, in fact, with this male, with Tingana, and I think she'd even mated with the Anderson male off, off to the west. So, quite an interesting situation, and it's also interesting to think that maybe, ironically, the fact that Sindila went into rehab has actually saved him from the same fate that every single other cub she's ever had has suffered. So that's interesting. Shamel, you asked a question, sorry, while I was in the middle of waffling away there, and I've now unfortunately forgotten what it was. Kirsten? Oh, has anyone seen Zara? And Zara, of course, is the cub, unofficial name that I gave her. Um, no, not since I think she was seen on her own the first time these two were seen mating, which was about, what, two weeks ago? I think it was about two weeks ago that they were first seen mating. So, no one has seen Zara since then, as far as I know. It's a rather interesting and tragic situation. Of course, this is the joy of what we do. We're unfolding things uh, that I think many people don't manage to do because they don't spend the extended periods that we do with these animals. And at the same time, we have the joy and triumph of Karula and her amazing life and her successes. And we have this rather tragic situation here with Shadow, Karula's daughter, where there seems to be some form of hormonal imbalance, we think. We're not sure. Nobody really knows exactly what's happening. Let me move a little bit around this tree, see if we can't get a good look. Oh, and RJ, you say, is that attack normal after mating? It's absolutely normal, and it happens for a rather slightly awkward reason, RJ. The males 
penis is barbed. Now I encourage you, if you want to know what that means, because it's difficult to imagine, to actually Google it, and there you will find pictures of what is termed a cat's barbed penis. And what it means is that it is painful for her when he withdraws, when he dismounts. It's not pleasant for her at all. And so what happens is that she turns and she wheels and she tries to smash him. At the same time, it's sore for him. And I think what it does, we think, is creates a contraction inside her and that probably helps with insemination and it probably also stimulates ovulation. There we are. A rather tragic figure of shadow. Heir to the throne. No, she's not quite heir to the throne. She's not the oldest. No, she is the oldest of Karula's cubs. Hello, Smiley in England. You want to know when leopards become sexually mature. Smiley, leopards become sexually mature normally at about two and a half years. But, you know, normally they don't mate. If they're males, they won't mate until they are probably five, maybe four if they're lucky. But in the case of the females, they can mate from about two and a half years old. And Sorry, I have forgotten the second part of your question. My mind is nowhere today. What was the second part there, Kirsty? Sorry about that. Oh, how long do they live for? Right. So the record male age is 14 years, or 15 years. That was the Campan male from Londolozi, just down the road. And the record female, unconfirmed in this area, is 18 years, but confirmed from just across the river at about 17 years. So the males definitely live a bit longer. Rather a terrifying sight that, isn't it? And just listen to the residual growl. sleep again. Now this, if you haven't seen mating leopards before everybody, is normal. This particular situation where the female will basically I initiate just about all mating. It can go on for as much as five days. They can mate apparently sort of at least, mm, I don't know, I mean per hour they can probably mate at least 12 times an hour, sometimes a little bit more than that. And so you can work out how many times during the course of an Easter cycle they might mate, but it's a lot. And that tends to take, I mean, before Karula can leave these last two, we were starting to cast aspersions on Tingana's ability to father children because she mated with him, I think it was five or six times, um, sort of, and I don't mean in one event, so it was five or six weeks that she mated with Tingana before she conceived little Shongile and Hosanna. Hello, Fitz Dog. You say, is it possible that Shadow's hormonal imbalance could be due to inbreeding if Shadow is both father, at least Tingana is both father and grandfather? I don't know enough about the genetics to say yes or no, Fitz Dog, but I do know that that's not the case here, of course, because Tingana is not Shadow's father. Tingana is the same age as Shadow. He's indirectly by marriage her uncle as well, I suppose, because he has fathered her uh, nephews and nieces. But no. So, I mean, look, I think, as we keep saying with the cats, apparently six 
generations of inbreeding is survivable before any kind of deleterious effects are noticed. Whether that would manifest in something physiological like a um, slightly out of whack hormonal, hormonal cycle, yes, it's possible. Um, interestingly, it, it's, it's suspected, in fact, quite strongly so, that um, Karula and Shadow are mother and daughter but also sisters, so that they had the same father. So that's quite interesting. So that may be something to do with it. That's a really good thought. I don't know. I'm not sure that anyone would be able to answer that question, but yes, I'm, I would say certainly one might expect that to be the case. It's quite nice, this too, because you can see the difference between the sizes there. So what I'm going to ask Jandre to do is to... Jandre, if you can keep it at the same zoom, so if you, if you know what I mean, so if you zoom into whatever frame you want on the male and then just pan straight across to the female because they're parallel with each other and you'll see the difference in the size. So there's the male's head filling what, say, what should we say, Jandre, about, well, let's fill it up as much as possible. What have we got there? About a f almost a full frame. Now if we just pan straight across the female because she's about the same distance from us. You can see how much smaller she is, you see that? I mean, her angle is slightly different, but it really is remarkable. His head is almost twice the size of hers. Now, a question about how long they will keep mating for. Well, the last time, the last time they mated, and it's from Deborah in South Carolina, the last time they mated, it only lasted about... I think it was only about two days. That's unusual. But it isn't unusual for a leopard that's coming into what we call a proto-estrus. So sometimes before they come into full estrus, before they go into ovulate, they will come into a short estrus, mate a bit, and then go off. That's what happened here. That's what happened the last time she came into estrus while she had Cindela here. And then let's see if this is a full estrus. I think it's probably that they've been mating maybe two days now, maybe only a day. And let's see how long this lasts. But Deborah, it can last for five days. If it's a full-blown estrus, it'll go often for five days. After which the male can almost be seen running away. Now, 300 meters east of here, we have the mother and sister of Shadow, and indeed the consort of the great Tingana, the queen of Juma herself, with Jamie Kurula. It seems as though all of our leopards are seriously concentrated in one place at the moment. Just have a look at that incredibly impressive feat. Look at that tree that Karula managed to hoist that impala kill up into. Absolutely mind-boggling. I'm seriously, seriously impressed with the beautiful Queen of Juma, who is currently taking a very well-deserved break in the shade, panting with a belly full of impala, and just enjoying a little bit of time off. As for her little spotted offspring, well, I have no idea where they are. I know they're here somewhere. I'm keeping my voice down just in case we're close to them, but I don't think that we are. I think they've just moved off somewhere into the shade, quite possibly to the relief of Mum, enjoying some cub-free time all to herself. It's a me time, which I think all mothers can attest as being something essential to one's survival as a mother, especially when you're a single mother of two boisterous, as of today, seven-month-old leopard cubs. It's the first time that I've seen them in, I think, probably over a month, and I'm absolutely astounded at how much they've grown, and at the same time, very, very impressed with Karula's mothering skills, as she continues to prove why she has earned the reputation of the Queen of Juma. At 12 years old, she's had a seriously impressive run of things. Several successful litters that have been raised to adulthood, including Shadow, who is, of course, with James not far from us as we speak, consorting with Tingana, the leopard Don Juan of the area. And she is absolutely passed out, fast asleep. Just the twitch of her ears and her panting breathing 
gave her away. You can see the flies fluttering around and her paws resting carefully and neatly. And welcome to Roger on the Sunset Safari. You wanted to know how close this Impala Kill is to the Arethusa Dam. Give me a second, Roger. I need to do some rough calculations in my head. The answer is quite far, um, to give you a, a very basic answer. The more specific answer is probably in a straight line, about maybe four and a half, five kilometers. Those of you who want to convert into miles, that's not my strong point for some reason. Miles seem to escape me. I'm fine with Fahrenheit, feet and weight, but miles is a little bit more tricky. The answer is relatively far. The nearest water from here is probably the Juma Dam. Uh, you might even get a chance to see Karula going across for a drink at some point. The question, of course, is how does Karula feel about the fact that 300 meters away from her is her daughter Shadow mating with Tingana. She must know, she absolutely will know, that they are there. As you may have noticed with James, it's not a quiet or subtle thing, a mating of two leopards. So she must be aware of their presence, and I wonder if she isn't, doesn't feel a little bit concerned. Well, she doesn't, certainly doesn't look concerned. But if I were her, I'd be a bit concerned about the prospect of Tingana coming through and enjoying a little bit of a, a snack to keep up his energy, so to speak. He's not a threat to her cubs. They've been seen sharing kills before. And as the potential father, we'll never, we won't know, of course, until the DNA comes through, but as the potential father, he's definitely not going to in any way be vicious or unpleasant towards those little cubs, although because he's mating, it sometimes makes male cats a little bit more unpredictable in terms of their responses. How's it, Orbs? Sorry, just saying hello to one of the other vehicles that has decided to come in. As I said, I don't know exactly where her little ones are hiding. I have no doubt they're somewhere in the shade. Perhaps they too heard the sound of the consorting leopard pair. They've probably just gone to find themselves a nice patch of shade. It's not exactly an easy spot here. And it's relatively unpleasant in terms of the amount of sun exposure that's around here. So they might have decided to move to a more comfortable patch and just settle there for now. And we're just going to play the patience game. We're not going to go and actively look for them. We're just going to wait for them to come to us. Then we know that they'll be back at some point over the next few hours. And perhaps at some point we'll have to leave and then come back. But nevertheless, I hope that we're here when they start to come out. And maybe they'll even give us a demonstration of their tree climbing. Now, this morning's sunrise safari was a Astoundingly beautiful. Look at that. There's a whirlwind of leaves. I don't know if you can get that, Dave. It's a dust devil, so a little sort of tornado. I'm completely distracted by all of the leaves that are flying about in the air. It's awesome. Well done, Dave. I thought it was a cub sneaking up on me, but it's just the leaves. Oh, and I think Karula heard it too. Head up, ever so briefly. Oh, and back down again. And as I said, the, this morning's lighting was absolutely beautiful, and Karula giving us an incredible demonstration of her tree climbing abilities as she leapt nimbly from branch to branch and then ever so slightly fell down towards the end. She saved it though, with the true grace of a leopard. It didn't even look mildly embarrassed, which is fair enough. It was an impressive tree climbing feat. It remains to be seen how her youngsters are going to cope with trying to get up there and feed. I have a sneaking suspicion that they might make her life a little bit more difficult. She knows exactly, with her 12 years experience and her strong jaws and muscles, how to keep an impala kill up in a tree. 
Her little ones are, well, let's just say they don't have quite the same level of technique just yet. And I'm sure she's hoping against hope that there won't be any chance that, or that there isn't any, and there won't be an opportunity for one of them to knock it down onto the ground, because I'm sure that's not a feat that she feels like performing twice. <laughs> I feel very under scrutiny, Dave. <laughs> There's um, several of the guests that have just arrived and they seem to be most curious as to what it is we're doing here. Anyway, back to Karula. Deborah, you're saying that she looks a little bit thin or is it just because she's lying flat on the ground? She doesn't look gorged, does she? She doesn't look as though she's really seriously tucked into that impala just yet. I think it's because she was a little bit tired. She ate a bit this morning and then went off to fetch her cubs and I think she's really just taking a break. And when the temperature starts to drop a little bit, then she'll be able to go up and feed herself a bit more. She's not thin, but she definitely hasn't eaten a huge amount. We've seen Karula before with a, a belly that looks like the equivalent of swallowing a beach ball. She hasn't quite reached that stage yet, but if we're lucky, and that impala kill stays in that tree, we could have fantastic times spent ahead with her for at least another two days, if not more. It is a beautiful setting. I wonder where those little cubs are hiding. And I agree, Debbie. Um, Debbie is watching in Vancouver and I think shares the same thought that Brian and myself had this morning which was we so wished we'd been here just that fraction earlier for when she did actually hoist that impala kill because it is such an amazing display of strength. I'm really not joking when I say that that tree is probably about 10 meters high. It's absolutely massive and there's nothing, I mean there's no foothold, paw hold, it must have been phenomenal to watch. We can only picture it in our heads at this point as to what it must have looked like. But funnily enough, Debbie, Brian and myself, it was the first thing we said when we got here, was that we wished we could have been there to see her pull it up into a tree. Because my goodness, that is truly incredible. Hopefully she doesn't have to do it again, but you never know. Now, of course, one thing that we were really excited about when we realized that she was going to fetch her cubs was the moment where they had to work out how to get up there and feed off the carcass. And as far as I know, little Hosanna, the little chief, the little male cub, was the first to make his ascent in that courageous way of theirs. Luckily, little baby leopard cubs, like little children, are relatively resilient and quite bouncy. They tend to be okay when they fall down. They go all floppy, just like human beings can do. So if they were to fall out, they'd probably be absolutely fine. But well done, Karula. And Joanne has asked a lovely question, because of course we've t spoken about how impressed we are with Karula's skill as a mother. And the question further is, well, why are we so impressed with that? And that's because they, we have such an enormously high mortality rate. And Joanne wants to know what the difference is between the mortality rate of leopards, lions, and cheetah. It's a difficult one to answer because the circumstances dictate what the sort of... Sorry, guys, I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel. Um, it does, it's, it's dictated by the situation, the circumstances, and the area that you're in. But leopards have a roughly 70% mortality rate before they are a year old. But that's not the case, necessarily, because as we know, Karula has beaten those odds time and time again, as, ha uh, as Shadow has done the reverse of that particular way of raising cubs. Lions have a slightly lower mortality rate, but if there's a takeover or coalition takeover happening, then they have a 100% mortality rate, because the males seek out and kill the cubs, or almost probably about a 90% mortality rate. Sometimes they manage to get away. 
cheetah, it's very, very high. But again, it depends upon the amount of prey available. As you know, they are probably the least successful of the big cats. But it also depends on your lion density, because the higher your lion density, the higher the mortality rate for cheetah's cub loss, or cheetah cubs. In the, in the number of cheetah cubs that I've seen, and I'm thinking back specifically to several litters that I've had the chance to watch grow up, probably it was an average of maybe one in four surviving, although most of the time all the, the females concerned lost all of their litters, admittedly in an area with very high lion concentration. And the more you interfere with the numbers of the different cats, and the less you leave nature to do its thing, the harder it becomes for the different animal species. We don't realize the impact that we have until we've done it, which is why it's always best to let nature do her thing. And Karula is a perfect example of some serious, I don't know if it's genetic advantage, if it's skill, if it's talent. James thinks it's innate talent. I'm starting to agree with him. Herbert thinks that she catches one kill leaves it for the hyenas as a distraction, and then goes off and catches another kill. Whether or not that is the case, it would be phenomenal if it was. I love that theory. I think it's a very interesting one. Might just be that she catches one thing, the hyenas take it, and then off she goes. Either way, I think it's a very clever little theory he's thought out. And just like that, we have a Karula all to ourselves, once again. And now we play the patience game. I did take the final control members and the rest of the crew out to go and see Karula and her lovely little cubs after the end of the sunrise safari, partly because I, I wanted to see them and secondly because not all of our crew get to go out on a game drive each and every single day. So we all went out and enjoyed a bit of time and it was, how did Alex describe it? Like Putin's press conference in terms of the number of cameras that were clicking away. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. Lots and lots of beautiful photos came out of that particular viewing session as the lovely Shungile, Karula's daughter, came up and had a bit of a bonding session with Mum. Got some gentle kisses and licks and returned some. It was a beautiful sighting. Hosanna decided that he wanted to be a little bit more independent and wandered off and disappeared behind a termite mound. but it was a very special morning spent with them. <laughs> a little bit of a stretch, shifting around her back legs. I'm, I'm splitting my attention, sorry. I've got my mind half on Karula, keeping an eye on her out of the corner of my eye, and also trying to contort myself into various positions to try and see whether I haven't missed something obvious in terms of where the cubs might be. They can sometimes be so incredibly hidden, especially when they're flat like this. And since they're half the size of Karula, they're twice as difficult to find. That's still a little bit too warm. I think we'll settle here and just wait for them to come to us. Dave, you haven't spotted them, have you? I feel you're not keeping that secret from all of us. <laughs> and we have had some truly extraordinary days recently, as I mentioned at the start of the Sunset Safari from incredible lion sightings to leopards. It feels like the place is teeming with leopards at the moment. Oh, speaking of leopards, by the way, there is a great deal of controversy over which female leopard we saw yesterday afternoon. I, of course, got terribly excited because I thought that it was in Kanyeni, who I have not yet seen on Cheetah Plains. I never got a chance to have a proper good look at elephants. Sorry, distraction. There's elephants screaming off in the distance. You won't have been able to hear them. 
I never had a chance to look at her properly. I was distracted by several and other things that was going on at the time, including towards the end an influx of Styx cubs, Styx lion cubs arriving. But for those of you who are followers of our different leopards, and of course I know most of you are in terms of our regular viewers, it looks as though it's Tundi's daughter, her older daughter, which makes more sense now when I look back on it. And I, th I always, I've never seen in Kanyeni, but I always thought she looked, she was slightly older than the leopard that we saw yesterday. So it does turn out, I mean, I've never seen in Kanyeni before, and it was just what I was told, but it, it turns out there's a good chance that the leopard S that we saw yesterday was not in fact in Kanyeni and was another leopard. If it is Tundi's daughter, her older daughter, Tundi is the twin sister of Shadow and the daughter of Karula. So Karula's one of Karula's oldest daughters. And I think that's a new leopard for us. I, I mean, it's definitely a new leopard for me either way. And one that hasn't been given a name officially by the different guides as far as I know. She's a nameless female. So perhaps we'll have to start thinking about possible names for her. Tundi, of course, is one of my absolute favorite leopards. Shadow's sister, Karula's other daughter, and she's got her two cubs are alive and well as of yesterday. And while Karula snoozes her way to save up her strength for the steep climb to her dinner, Let's go across to two other snoozing leopards who are saving their strength for something else. Indeed, much snoozing is going on, everybody. It's a warm, soporific afternoon of 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius. It's very pleasant sitting in the sun. It doesn't feel too hot at all. Now, they have m mated once more, everyone. Um, and then they went back to sleep. It wasn't a sort of, wasn't really a full-blown mating, I wouldn't say. But they have done it once more, and I think it will continue. Well, let's see. It'll be interesting to know whether this continues for the full sort of Easter cycle of about five days or so, or if, like last time, it's a sort of an Easter's where, or false Easter's where she kind of comes into Easter for two or three days, and then the mating stops. I always, I quite like the way they're lying there because. Their tails are just sort of touching each other, sort of in um I don't know, it's, it's quite loving, I feel. They lay apart from each other initially, but I quite like the fact that they are uh, sort of touching romantically. Isn't that nice, Rondre? Yes. Doesn't warm the cockles of your heart? Light yes, light a candle, yes. Very good idea. Janet, you say mating leopards are very different from mating lions. I would agree with you, Janet. And you say it just seems that the female leopards are much more aggressive. They're certainly the initiators. Uh, you know, when you, if you watch mating lions, the f female will walk away from the male and he'll then get up and try and initiate a mating sequence where that just does not occur with the leopards. You're absolutely correct. It is only the female who tends to start this kind of thing and absolutely it is different in some ways but in many ways it's the same it's aggressive with the males at least with the lions in the same way uh, they have the same sort of structure of the penis it's also barbed and so it makes it very uncomfortable for the female so that's quite interesting and it also goes on for an inordinately long time so they mate multiple times over a number of days in order for the female to ovulate and then to conceive. But at the moment, the only thing indicating that Tingana is indeed alive is when a fly lands on his ear and he flicks it off. And now not even that anymore, he's far too exhausted. <laughs> huh? 
Hello, Moto Cross. You want to know how long, how often it is they have to mate? Uh, no, have to eat while they're mating. Um, I don't. It depends. You know how, how long before they mated that they had to eat. Are you all right, Jean Andre? Jean Andre looks like he's about to die of a consumptive fit. If he does well, Moto Cross, well, they'll have something lovely to eat right here. Although, well, I mean, they'll have something to eat. I don't know how lovely it'll be. Um, Moto Cross. If they've eaten just before they start mating, they can probably go two days or so. But often what happens is in a full-blown Easter cycle, so say five days or so, they'll eat together. So they'll go and find something to eat and they'll have a romantic sort of um, lover's meal. You know, an impala strung in a tree or something romantic like that during the course of the mating period. But they probably wouldn't kill something more than once during the course of a mating period. Thank you, Motocross. In the case of Jandre, of course, he would last him more than a few days, just on account of the size of his calves, which are like two enormous hams. So they could have one each of those, I suppose, and then they'd be full for weeks. <laughs> Once they'd got over the taste, of course. Not a lot, not a lot going on here, is there, Jandre? Hello, Monique in London. Nice one from you. You said, does Panthera have this sc shadow scat yet? Now, Jamie explained, I'm sure, what that scat collection malarkey is all about. And you want to know, have they got her scat? And could they tell from that if there was some kind of hormonal imbalance? I don't think so, Monique. They do have a scat, definitely. I think I gave it to her. I gave it to them. In fact, Jandre and I collected it, if I'm not mistaken, on the Gari, at least on the, the Triple M road, uh, about a year ago, probably. Uh, so, yes, they have got a scat. But it's for DNA analysis, and I don't think, you know, they don't know what the genes actually mean. They don't know about the genome of leopards any more than they know exactly what genes cause diseases or hormonal imbalances in humans. There'll be some that they can tell about, but I think as far as leopards go, uh, no, I don't think they'd be able to tell that. I imagine, yes, like you say, but they would have to use blood. Absolutely. We don't have any results from that stuff, and I don't know, I mean, I'm not sure why it's taking so long or if we will ever get results from it. The scientists all over the world tend to be quite, um, quite jealous of their data. Right, while these two sleep, uh, maybe we should go to another sleeping cat. <laughs> and if these guys bother to get up again, well, then you'll come straight back here. Ooh, hang on a second. One second. No, she's gone back down. Let's go back to Karula and find out what she's doing. And as you can see, much has changed here. We seem to be surrounded by sleeping cats over the last few days, but we are definitely not in the position to do any complaining. Apparently there is actually a sleeping lion on Juma as well, a male lion, that because the, our morning was so busy this morning, James and myself didn't even get to. So at some point one of us will probably pop past there and go and have a look at him before returning. To, I don't know, we're so spoiled for choice. I said this yesterday, I feel that way today as well. We're so spoiled for choice with our different cat sightings. But the sleepy cats are here, which definitely means summer is well on its way. <laughs> and Karula, for one, couldn't have been happier about it. You're giving us a gentle rollover. Now she's presenting us with a different view of her long, slender, yellow back. Hey, girl, we can't even see your face now. Gently rubbing her face. I was going to tell you something and it's completely gone out of my head. Goodness. It'll come back to me at some point, I promise. I, c I cannot remember what it was I was going to tell you. It can't have been frightfully important. 
Well, while we wait for Karula to, or for the temperatures to drop and for Karula to jump up into the marula tree, Cheryl, you wanted to know if the cubs have had a chance to feed. Now, apparently this morning I was with Tingana and Shadow, so I got distracted a little bit by what was going on with them. But it sounds as though Hosanna, the little boy, made his way up and had a bit of a nibble at the impala carcass. Not much has been eaten, just a little bit of the backside and then some of the organs and apparently one leg that at some point was detached from the rest of the animal and fell down to the ground whereupon Shungile seized upon it and gave it all, seized upon whatever scraps were dropped and nibbled a little bit on that as well. They certainly looked well fed when I saw them this morning when we came back at the end of the sunrise safari. They're not hungry at the moment, obviously. It's far too much effort to get all the way up into that tree. Now, here's a point that I've noticed about this particular marula tree. Whilst it is beautifully high and well out of the reach of anything like a hyena, unless it was a sort of 30 foot tall hyena, which would be utterly terrifying all on its own, typically leopards tend to choose slightly more foliated leaves or trees to stash their kills in. So something like a jackalberry or an apple leaf usually serves their purpose slightly better, or a marula tree in summer, but less so in spring before it's got its leaves. And that's because this particular impala is now very, very easy to spot for a different type of scavenger. Oh, hold on. Do we have... No, just, just shifting. Just shifting quite a full belly around, I think. Trying to make herself more comfortable. It's not exactly the shadiest spot in the world. But yes, sorry. Typically, a leopard will, like Karula, especially with her experience, will choose a leaf, a tree with more cover so that the birds don't find it quickly. Things like battaliers and tawny eagles, even a vulture, because it's so open, will be keen-eyed enough to spot this particular kill and could potentially dislodge it if it were to try and descend and feed upon it. That's one of the big reasons why leopards try and hide their kills in slightly leafier trees, which is, oh, that was such a half-hearted yawn, big girl. No more? Shape, she's too hot. Very, very warm. And there you go for Fox Hat. Lovely to have you on our sunset safari. As Karula pants away, you wanted to know, is her breathing normal for a sleeping cat? Yes, it is, absolutely. Especially one with a very full belly. So she's panting like that because she's hot. I thought she was going to listen for the cubs, but she's gone back into relaxed posture. The fox hat, yes it is. Her digestive process, with all of that meat, it's the same for all predators, produces a tremendous amount of heat very quickly. And if you combine that with the fact that we're in the sort of mid-80s Fahrenheit this afternoon, she's panting to cool down. She can't sweat like human beings can sweat. So she has to lose heat a different way, and that's the way that she's going about it. So you'll always, always see our big cats panting, even on coolish days, when they've had a big meal. Now, just for that briefest second, her body language changed, and you can read so much in the expressions and the body postures of these animals. And you can immediately see when she's relaxed and when she's listening. There, she's relaxed. Yes, she's half listening, and it's all in the ear twitch and the, the sort of position of the head and the whole posture that gives it away. So at one point there, while I was talking about the answer to her breathing, both ears looked forward in the same direction, sort of pointed forward in the same direction. She focused. They just become slightly more intent. There's this very gentle flexing of the facial muscles. And you can immediately tell, the more you sit with animals, and those of you who work with domestic animals will know this, you can immediately tell what that animal's not necessarily thinking specifically about, but you can narrow down exactly what it's feeling. There she's dozing. She's basically falling asleep with her head up. And definitely not yet contemplating the 
a serious climb that's ahead of her. There we go. Lovely yawn. And spot on, Daniel. Very well done. Daniel is one of our newer viewers and said that it seems as though leopards seem to catch their prey by surprise rather than a long run that cheetahs do. And absolutely, they're ambush predators. So they usually try and sneak up between sort of five, maybe, maybe ten meters to their prey. So that's about between 15 to 30 feet before they actually launch their attack. And that's because they've got, whilst they're very powerful and very fast, that is only over a very short period of, or short distance of time. That's short, short distance of time is not a good way of describing that. That doesn't exist. Over a short distance, I know, I'm sorry, Karula, I know that was terribly boring of me. Only over a short distance or for a short period of time. So they can move at around, they can cover 24 meters per second. So that's, I mean, just think about that. Stop and let that sink in for one second. Karula could be from where she is now into the car with us in half a second. Not, of course, that that is something that she's going to do, but she could if she wanted to. You don't underestimate a leopard's speed and strength. As some, the, the couple of times that I've surprised leopards on foot, they've been past me before I've barely registered exactly what it is I'm seeing, if they're skittish leopards. A cheetah, on the other hand, can run for a slightly longer time period, or does run for a slightly longer time period. They can sustain it for a little bit, a little while, but again, they're not, not marathon runners. That title goes hands down to the wild dogs with their stamina. Cheetah, you're looking at maybe 100, maybe 200 meters, and they're probably, of all of the big cats, the least successful of the hunters in terms of kills initiated versus kills completed. Just a little interesting fact there. I've seen the Nkuhumas, the lions, chase buffalo for a good two or three kilometers before. But that's an unusual situation. All of our big cats have limited bursts of speed. Standing by, Ephraim. Oh, goodness gracious. A royal toilet break. Almost perfectly positioned behind a tree, but not quite. If it's just myself here, you're welcome to come and join. No sign of them of pimpans for now. Ah, oh, we've been speaking a lot about DNA. Oh, she's calling. Interesting. and fetch her cubs for us. Or she might go and find a better patch of shade. <laughs> yep, better patch of shade will do. Just wait for one second before I reposition. I just want to see if she is calling. I'm just listening carefully. She did give the softest of ooh, sounds as she got up. And she is looking around. She's not calling. Let's reposition and go and join her for a slightly better view. And Yorky Paws in Arizona. At first I thought your name was Gorky Paws, and I do apologize for that. I nearly made a terrible blunder. But Yorky Paws has wanted to know, while we reposition to get another view of the Queen of Juma, whether or not it would be possible that Karula would adopt Shadow's cub since she in the, is the grandmother. A couple of years ago, we would... I'm sorry, I'm just going to wait for Ephraim to come in first since we've, had, we've been sort of monopolizing the better view. We'll just wait for him to come in. 
<coughs> She's up again. Sorry, Yorkie Paws. <coughs> Changed my mind. We're going to move. Yorkie Paws, I promise I'll get back to your question in one second. Not one second, that's an exaggeration. I'll get back to your question in a couple of seconds. Because it's a really nice question and it has a really interesting answer. Oh, flat cat again. Okay, no rush. I'm just going to pull over here and let Ephraim come past so that he can get a view for his guests. No problem. Okay. We'll go that way then. Now there is a recorded case, there is an entire scientific article about it, journal article, about a grandmother leopard that had cubs of her own and went on to adopt one of her daughter's cubs. They were sharing a kill, which does happen. It's unusual, but it does happen. Oh, she's kind of found herself into a re in a really tricky spot. I'm just going to stop for now. Um, and just, just double check that I'm not going to scare any little cubs away before we move in. So there was a case where a grandmother leopard adopted her daughters. As I said, they were sharing a kill, which is quite unusual. And grandmom got up with her cubs and walked off, and her daughter's cub joined her and proceeded to stay with her until adulthood. That is exceptionally rare. It's one of those rare cases. It happened on Londolozi, as far as I know, which is not too far away from where we are now. It could even be a relative of a leopard that we have heard of before. But a very, very interesting situation. Karuda's never done it, as far as I know. No, she hasn't. We would have known. But it would be... Can you imagine if that situation played out? If one day we came through and Karula had three cubs instead of two. And Shadow's little cub bounding happy and healthy next to her. It would be lovely if life worked like that. And what a lovely comment coming through from Yorkie Paws. And I'm so glad I did get my, your name right. I hope I got your name right, Yorkie Paws. Now, apparently, Yorkie Paws has been lurking, watching the show. Lurking sounds horrible. I feel bad when I say the word lurking. But Yorkie Paws has been watching the show for many years, and this is the first question that they have uh, had answered. That's lovely to hear, Yorkie Paws, and it is very special to hear from you. Obviously, you, having watched for years, are intimately familiar with our lovely leopards of the various areas. And for new viewers, we do encourage you please to send through your questions. We can't, of course, get through every single question that's out there, but we do love to hear from you and get your questions coming through. So you can send those through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And please don't feel shy or ashamed of the question that you're answer asking just because some of our viewers have been watching for very many years and they've learnt a great deal about African wildlife, but that doesn't mean you can't ask the more basic questions if you want to. We love hearing from all of our viewers. And Karula has shifted around again. Let's play a game of where the cubs are. Hmm... I'm going to guess and say they're hidden somewhere around that termite mound. That's my guess. <coughs> what do you think, Dave? Do you think they're somewhere there? Hmm. I think they're somewhere around here. So while we try and play spot the cub, quite literally, Let's go across to James, who has left his spotted cats, and let's find out what his plans are for the rest of the afternoon. 
What we've got going on here, everybody, is quite an interesting situation. We've left the mating pair. That's Batelier and a tawny eagle. And they're not far. We're still only about, mm, maybe only 150 meters or so from where Karula is with her kill. And I'm pretty sure that that's what these guys are looking at. Batelier and tawny eagle, always a good indication of a kill. But what is interesting is that I think if we looked hard enough from where we're sitting to the left-hand side of your picture, we could probably see where the kill is. But for these birds, it's really easy. And what happens is, you see these birds in the tree, and you come and you look in the immediate vicinity, don't see anything, and then give up, when it actually could be quite far away. I think they're probably 100 meters or so, 330 feet from where we are now. Isn't that nice? It's a tawny eagle. Beautiful. And we'll just, there's a juvenile batelier, I think, on the tree in front of us. You can go and have a look at that as well once Jandre has finished making art with that lovely tawny eagle. Very nice. Well, I was talking to the bird more than I was to you. But yes, I mean, you did an okay job. Well done. In fact, there's another tawny eagle here, everybody. There was a juvenile batelier flying around, but it's gone. And let's just have a look at this tawny eagle. There is a little bit of traffic on the road, so we'll have to get off the road. Aye! There's a lovely shot of a tawny eagle. You won't get a much better shot than that. Isn't it great? I love the piercing look that they give. There he goes. And you may have heard some dwarf mongoose calling as he took off. And he's gone straight towards where the kill is. <laughs> that was quite inconvenient of him. It would be nice if he'd flown across the front, wouldn't it? We'll tell him to do that next time, Jandre. That'll make your life a little bit easier. Righty, on we go. Now, we've got a couple of things we could do. Um, I will probably do all of them. We're going to first of all go past where there was a male lion on Twin Dams Road. I've no doubt if he's still there, he'll be so fast asleep that we might fall asleep watching him. It'll be so boring. And then I think we'll pop past the other pride and see if the Ninkahumas are around and what their cubs are doing. The Ninkahuma cubs are great entertainment, so we'll see what they're doing. In the meantime, perhaps on the way, we'll find some elephants. And that would also be very nice. It's been quite hot. But I mean, I must say, it doesn't feel hot. We were set in the sun there with those leopards. I didn't feel too sweaty. Did you feel sweaty, Jandro? No. No. Jandro? No, never mind. Hello, Andy in Kentucky. You want to know when the rainy season is expected? It's very difficult to say, but it's any time sort of from the middle of this month to the end of November. And the later it gets, obviously, the more likely the rain is to come. Last year, we had 20 millimeters, which is about an inch. Thank you, Jean-Dre. Stian Bok, everybody. We had about an inch in the middle of September. So that was quite nice. There's a little Stian Bokke. And then we didn't have much, we, we only had about 10 times that during the course of the year, which is very little indeed, and we had a long, long gap between the two. Uh, but normally you'd expect it to be the first rain sort of in November, first big rains. But La Nina, which is the weather system that is brewing in the Southern Ocean, I think it brews there. Where does it brew, jean -Ray? Do you know where La Nina brews? I do not. I think it's in the Sun Ocean. It might not be. It might be in the Indian Ocean. Anyway, it's going to blow a lot of very rainy weather this way, so we are told. Of course, betting on the weather is a little bit like betting on the stock market, which in turn is a little like betting on the roulette table, despite what many stock brokers would like to tell you. <laughs> now, there's quite some, something quite interesting here. Jandre, I see that there's a new lodge in town. Jackie's Sabi House. Well, I wonder who Jackie is when she's not at home. 
Ah, quite a nice logo, isn't it, Jondre? Very, uh, very, very pretty. I wonder where it is. Established in 2016. Ah, that's what it says. <laughs> good. Uh, you've obviously got to have exceptionally good eyes to be able to see where Jackie's Salby camp is. Hello, Jack. Oh, not not Jack. I've got Jackie's Sabi Bush Camp on the on my mind. Hello, Brock in Pennsylvania. You say it seems to you that the big cats like to use. John, what are you doing? Sorry, he's shaking about a bit, Jean Dre. Yes, there we go. That's much better. Uh, Brock, you say very ap accurately that the big cats tend to use the roads and the game paths as sort of roadways and pathways. And the elephants don't seem to use the roads. They're always in the bush. Brock, they do use the roads. Not as much, but they don't use them as much because they don't use them for transport. When an elephant is moving, normally it's moving into food and it's going to eat food or it's moving to water. And the roads are very short, seldom the shortest way to water. The roads are often used by the cats because they're quite often territorial boundaries because they're convenient territorial boundaries and it's also easier for them to walk along. If you're an elephant it doesn't really make a huge difference. There is one very notice, noticeable exception and that is the cheetah. Cheetah very seldom walk along roads. They will often cross them and then they'll walk in the fringing bush on the side. They don't want to be seen by anything else. And it's quite interesting when we see them at cheetah plains fairly regularly, they're normally moving parallel with the road as opposed to on it. And like you've correctly seen, lions and leopards much more likely to be actually on the road. Ah, right, now, Karula is no longer alone. Let's go and have a look. Karula's no longer alone for two reasons. One, the cub is there. Um, one, Tingana's just arrived. Yeah, standing by. Okay. It's reposition. The cub is there. I think Tingana's just arrived. There he is. Having a solid so sniff around. Okay. Let's go around. Let's reposition. I'm going to move out of the space between Karula and her cubs. He's Fleming grimacing for us. There's... Where's Karula? Is that Karula there? There's two of them. No, no, I mean... Is Shadow with him? Yeah. Okay, so her cubs are just here, that's why she was calling. I'm not sure if that is Karula or Shadow. Just hold on one moment. We'll establish it now. <laughs> this is exactly what I was expecting. I just didn't expect it to happen so soon. He's going to go up the tree. Where's Karula? She's calling for her cubs. Tingana's there. Karula's to the right. And she's chuffing for her babies. Making sure that they're safe. Where is Shadow? Is she here? There's Shadow. There she is. Oh. Sorry, Tingan has gone up the tree. He's going to go and steal from Karula's carcass. Has, has Karula realized that Shadow is on her way? This is awesome. This is what we were waiting for. Up goes Tingana into the tree. A difficult spot for a leopard that weighs as much as he does. And I barely know which way to look. Karula was chuffing for her cubs a moment ago, but I don't think she's realized that Shadow is behind Tingana, slowly making her way forward. Tingana balancing. 
balancing precariously on a tree that was not built for a leopard of his size and stature. It's all fine and well being dainty Karula or her little cubs. And just like that, I see her. Thanks, Ephraim. Here comes Shadow here. And just like that, Karula has potentially lost the best access to her hard-won meal. Shadow's just going to pop through this gap here. This is incredible. Where is she now? She's just coming. I can see her, but Dave can't. I don't want to reposition just yet. I want to see how this situation plays out. Let's go back towards... Oh, here she comes. Sorry, Dave. There she goes. Has Karula realized? There's Shadow slinking around the back. Making her way towards the kill. I don't know where the cubs are. We saw one of them earlier and we saw Karula chuffing to them. But did she chuff a warning? Now, before we get too nervous or too overexcited, just bear in mind that Shadow is Karula's daughter. We spoke about sharing kills before. So there's not a major threat to Karula or her cubs in this scenario. It's just a fascinating situation. Here's Shadow looking slightly with her nose out of joint. There's Karula watching the goings on with resignation. And then Tingana has planted himself up in the tree and is tucking into Karula's dinner. Oh, hold on. Sorry, Dave. I know I'm bouncing us all the way back. Look, Karula's spotted shadow. You can see it in her body language. Thoroughly unimpressed. We've seen these two wonderful ladies have disagreements before. Look at, look at Karula. Look how puffed up she is. She's heading her off. And Shadow is nobody's fool. He's not going to mess with Mom. She was heading her off. That was the direction that her cubs are in. And she's immediately blocking her. Doing what we saw Shadow do with Sindile when he first encountered her. Okay, we're going to reposition a moment just to give you an idea of what's happening. Oh, Shadow's on the run. Off she goes, pursued by Karula. Oh, and there she goes. Disappearing around the side of the termite mound. Oh, and on that situation, and Tingana's just nearly fallen out of the tree. It's just it's the most incredible scene. The male leopard is far more interested in filling his stomach than with the ne negotiations of the various leopards. Ephraim tells me that Shadow is still running to the west. Sh Tingana's up in the tree. Karula is chasing Shadow away. And what an amazing situation of dynamics here at play. A mother, a daughter, two young cubs that we can't see at the moment. And one big male who's far interested in the food. Okay, we're going to turn on, we're going to try and catch up with Karula and Shadow. I know this is an awesome scene with Tingana up in the tree. There are also other vehicles wanting to come and see this extraordinary scene. But for now, we are absolutely fine. It might split into two sightings again. We're going to climb on this termite mound. Hold on, Dave. This has been incredible. This is what I was waiting for. I was so desperate not to leave. I'd... Hello. Uh, Ephraim, have you still got visual? Yeah, Jimmy, the other one is getting more weight. Just take a few more cuts and weight through this phase of this junction. Copy, thanks. Jim, I'm just behind you. Make your way in text. I'll see if I can follow up on Shadow and Karula. Yeah, 
Uh, I did see a Pimpans briefly off to the south, so I'm going to pull out of the sighting so you can go in. Sorry, everybody, we've got to make space for the other vehicles as well. Taxon has just arrived. And where did Shadow and Karula go? We've all got to keep our eyes peeled. What an incredible way that this afternoon has played out. <laughs> and Wild Earth Gurley has said it's not even Catter Day this afternoon. What an extraordinary day. Five different leopards. And one sighting. Negative tax. Um, Tingana's up in the tree with a kill. Uh, the cubs were southeast of his at position. And then Kurula and Shadow were running this way. Absolutely. This is incredible. It's not Cat a Day. There you go, Dave. I knew there was, a, there was a reason. Something was telling me that something was going to happen. Okay, let's just... I don't think they're going to go too far. Karula's cubs are still there. She's not going to want to run too far away, but Shadow might have, and Shadow could have jumped this road in one stride if she was desperate to get away. Let's just stop here for a moment. I'm sorry, I have to listen to the game drive comms as well, just to hear. I think those two might have disappeared, but I doubt Karula's going to be gone for long. Her cubs are there, her kill is there, her man is there, if you want to get more specific than that. Absolutely extraordinary. Can't believe it. That was definitely not what I was expecting. I wonder how long Tingana knew that she was there. Shadow's gone, Karula's coming back. Hold on, everybody. Copy, thanks. Are you happy for me to come and join you at this sighting? Yeah, sure, you're welcome. Thanks, Tex. Where is she gone? I can't see anything. Hold on one moment. You don't reverse into me, please. <laughs> Kerry, while we go and try and figure out exactly where Karula has gone following behind Taxus. I'm being silly. This is silly. Let's go back to the... Oh, there they go. Oh, there they are. Thank you. There. Right there. I thought I was being silly, but I'm not. They're both here. Or at least one of them's here. Now, Kerry, you were wondering, you know why Tingana followed or came towards Karula, but why did Shadow join in? And the answer is because that is the imperative of a female leopard in estrus. She follows the male. And that's why we so often, when we've got mating leopards... I'm just going to keep a little bit of distance. Shadow's going to be unsettled. She's going to be upset. Let's just stop. She's going to be uncomfortable. There's Karula. She's behind Texan's vehicle and she's growling fiercely. You can see shadows dripping with saliva, which is very, very typical of a leopard that is stressed and unhappy. So, Kerry, it's her imperative to follow the male leopard. She, her biology tells her to mate, and her biology also tells her... There you go, she's relieving herself, also another sign of stress. Her biology tells her that... She's got to stay no matter where the male goes, which is why we've had Tingana bring Tundi into Karula's territory, Quetile, Shadow. It's when territorial boundaries don't matter. And she's also learnt 
that the male will be often quite protective over a female and estrus that he's mating with. So she's re was sort of kind of relying on Tingana to keep her safe. And Karula's unlikely to go for Shadow in a, ve in a very violent way. But it is an incredible interaction. She immediately stepped in to chase Shadow away from where her cubs are. But now Shadow's, Shadow's instinct is taking her straight back towards the male. And where is Karula? She's here somewhere. I can hear her. And Monique in London, yes, absolutely. Typically a male leopard would be more of a threat. However, this, because Tingana is, has mated... Oh look, she's going she gonna to mark her territory. No, I was going to be very surprised if she'd done that. So Monique, typically, yes, a male, is, a male leopard is one of the biggest killers of leopard cubs of any other... Let's go around, sorry guys, of any leopard cubs than any other predator. However, in this situation, leopards are more territorial with other females. There's Karula. Just a spotted cat hiding away. Where are her cubs, I wonder? Can you see her at all there, Dave? I'm going to go back towards Tingana. This is so hard to know where to go. She's just... There we go, I'll be able to show you here. I'll quickly show you. There she's up. Did I get Shadow and Karula mixed up? I don't think so. But it's possible. This other female is moving off. So Monique, she's more threatened by Shadow because Shadow is a female in her territory and it's basically natural instinct they're more territorial towards females and not at all towards males she's gonna mark her territory so a male leopard's territory as as i know you know encompasses that of several different females so she knows tingana she's not bothered but shadow is now in her space with a kill while she has a kill and her two cubs and she acted to prevent that situation from playing out. Uh, Tex, is that Karula with you there, or Shadow? Copy, thanks. Okay, either way, Karula's on her way back as well. It was Shadow that went back. Copy that, thank you. James Dungan, do I think that this interaction between all three of them will put a halt to Shadow's amorous activities with Tingana and will she have to go and find a new male? That's a very good point because Tingana is not going to shift from that carcass now. There's free food. He's going to do what male leopards do best, all leopards do best, which is scavenge. And he's going to steal Karula's kill. So James? My answer is no, I don't think so. I think Karuda's going to move off and I think she's going to take her cubs with her. And it's, she's going to leave Tingana and Shadow with this particular kill. That's my suggestion as to what's going to happen here. We'll have to wait and see how the scenario plays out. I'm sorry, I do have to be on the Game Drive channel. I need to clarify something with Tex first. Just bear with me one moment. We're just gonna get. Okay. Here comes. Here comes Shadow. Or is that Karula? I've lost track now. Just hold on one moment. Yeah, I can. Just, I can stand by behind you. 
That's Karula, right? I'm not going crazy. Yeah. She's not happy. You can see it. Every line of her body is saying this is not exactly what she wanted for her afternoon. Shadow has already made it to the kill. Just to give you an idea of what's happening around us, Karula's stalking slowly back towards them. But Tingana is still up in the Marula tree, and Shadow is at the base of it. Unfortunately, at some point, we are going to have to give up our spot in the sighting. There are lots and lots of vehicles that are now waiting to come in and join this exciting moment. Scraping her back feet. Marking her territory. And then we've got Tingana up in the tree. Oh, how beautiful. Shame, I feel sorry for her. She knows she's just lost her kill. She knows she's going to have to take her, her cubs away. She's not willing to go down without a fight just yet. Uh, Tex, I think with the Mapimpan still in the area, maybe it's best for a two vehicle lock. I'm going to pull out. Okay, copy. Thanks, Tex. Your call. We're just having a quick discussion about the logistics of the situation because, of course, two sightings have just become one sighting. So, obviously, we have to manage carefully in terms of which vehicles are where. There is Tingana, quite contentedly. He is so disinterested in the, what would we call it, the foibles of his ladies. He couldn't care less. That Karula and Shadow just had a little bit of a scrap. Not a scrap, really. They didn't come to blows, but that Karula chased Shadow. He's really just far more interested in the free dinner that's come along with the ride. Shadow is down below him, if we go down a little bit. She's currently, funnily enough, marking her tear, or mark, rubbing on her cheek on the various branches around her. Cheeky girl. And Karula is furious. It's very difficult for you to hear, but she is growling away. We're just going to go forward ever so slightly so that we can watch the action unplay, but we've got to pick a good spot where we can see everything happening. Hello, girl. Do you mind if I come join you? I know life's not great right now. After all that, you poor thing. Just going very, very slowly. We've got three leopards in the sighting and possibly five. Oh, the queen is blowing spit bubbles once again. If I go there, Dave, can you sort of see her? There, if I pop us here. Can you see Karula? Forward. Isn't this sighting absolutely incredible? You can see salivating away. Relatively stressed about this whole situation. Now, the reason that Karula recognizes Shadow as her daughter is I think leopards know each other. Like people know each other. They know which their do which is their daughter. Ah, uh, Shadow's go up the tree. Or she's thinking about going up the tree. So they do recognize each other, just like Tingana recognizes which female he's mated with, and therefore which cubs all may well be his. Now situations like this probably actually play out more often than we think. I know that Karula has been seen watching 
in Ghana mating with both Tandi and Kutile in her territory before. She's having a, just a jolly good sniff all around her. What an incredible scene. Five leopards, although two missing cubs. Yes, absolutely. A cat in Tampa. You've got that spot on. So I'm sorry, I've been so caught up in the chaos. I haven't properly compl I haven't properly explained everything that's going on. Shadow is in Karula's territory, but only just. Karula was always just on the boundary between her west, or sort of close to the western edge of her boundary and Shadow's eastern edge. Oh, Tingana, this is a precarious spot you find yourself in. Shadow. Sorry, Karula's so unimpressed. She just started growling next to me. Just wanted to make sure that she wasn't about to dash off. Cat in Tampa, yes. Shadow is in Karula's territory because Tingana brought her here. The Imperat. There you go. You can hear that deep, low rumbling coming from Karula. Isn't it peculiar? But we had that whole question about grandmothers adopting daughters cubs and all of a sudden shadow came into the sighting with Tingana. It's incredible. That impala is going to fall out of the tree. Sorry, we don't know where to look. Pick a leopard everybody. Which one should we look at? I think we should look at Tingana about to drop this impala out. It is, I don't even know how it's holding up there. Oh, 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 he saved it, sort of. It's gonna go, it's gonna go. Bernie, Bernie. Bernie, Bernie for Jamie. Sorry, everybody, just while the actions died down a little bit, I just want to take that opportunity to chat. Okay, while I just have a quick chat on the Game Drive channel, let's go across to James and a scavenging bird of prey. Amazing stuff, everybody, that we're having this afternoon. Really quite astounding there at the leopard sighting. Massively jealous of Jandre and I, but we're here with quite a large herd of beefaloes, or buffalo bulls, moving off to do their evening grazing to find what little grass there is left. And what's interesting is that one that we started with, sorry, Jandre, if we might go back to him, he's eating Peltiforum africanum, or the weeping wattle, and that is renowned, I've just read, as a very good cattle fodder. Though not surprisingly, a buffalo eating that. Now, there's quite a lot going on around the waterhole. As soon as something happens with those leopard, we will go back to them. But while we've got the initiative, if you like, over here, I'm just going to go back a little bit. <laughs> we can't see them, can we? I was going to ease my way down here, but there's a hippo out of the water. Uh, making friends with a giraffe, which is quite nice to see. So let's go and have a look-see. There we go. There's the hippo. We'll just, we, I think we're going to get too close to him because I think he'll run off, but I'll just show you his bottom first before we try a slightly closer approach. There we are, and I've just heard now 
that's the hippo's bottom, everybody. That's not what I've just heard. I've just heard that the lions apparently have moved off. So I don't think they are there. But we'll go and have a look and see what we can find there. And Aubrey reckons they might be around this area. All right, let's try and go a little bit closer to the hippopotamus. See what we can find there. He's not moving. We might have to make a fairly hasty retreat if he takes offence to us. I don't think he will. He is uh, exhibiting quite a startling amount of flatulence, which you can't hear, but I can. He's going to come out the side there, John. I don't want to follow him through there because I think he'll run. There you can see him just disappearing through the bushes. Ah, well done. Let's go. <laughs> we might get him going back into the dam. There he goes. Now, they don't like to stand still for us, you know. They get very nervous. There he is. Very nice. Now, Rondre, where's that rather... Oh, <laughs> have you seen the giraffe? He's right here. There he is. He's just walking out behind us. There we are. Isn't that nice? That's a bull giraffe with a, quite an overbite. Doesn't he have a bit of an overbite there, Jean-Dre? Perhaps in need of some orthodontic work. He's also got many passengers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It looked like about twenty ox peckers. So he really doesn't want Jean-Dre to film him. Let me just do it 180 quickly. Hippo's gone off down there. A number of times I've walked through there, sort of whistling away and thinking to myself, oh, this, what a pretty time this is. Now, one doesn't want to step into a hippopotamus when you're doing that. Now, Jean-Dre, now you have a lovely angle. And, of course, one speaks so often about the different species of giraffe or the different subspecies of giraffe that we get. I've only just seen one other, and that is the Maasai giraffe, of course. And they are found, unsurprisingly, in Kenya, in the Mara. And the difference, most noticeable difference is their markings. Their markings are much more irregular than the southern giraffes. There also aren't nearly as many ox peckers lurking about in them. I think there are, let me just get the binoculars out and have a look-see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Hello, Aaron in New Zealand. Do you want to know if the hippopotamus would eat anything that this giraffe dropped? Um, I'm, I don't think so, Aaron. You know, the giraffes don't do a great deal of dropping. You know, if you watch the way they feed, they don't break off branches like a, an elephant would. And so an elephant, you know, what an elephant might break off, absolutely, I think you'd probably easily find that hippos might eat those. Sort of off cuts. Ooh, and Jean-Ray, can you get a picture of the ox peckers? They're all having a bit of a dust bath, or are you unsighted? You got them there. 
There we are. Look at them. All back onto him. This is wonderful. Aaron, the other thing they do eat, of course, is elephant dung, especially at this time of the year. They will often eat elephant dung. Uh, that's because there's really not much in the way of grass at all. Jeez, there are hundreds of these things. One, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, one, twenty, two, twenty-two ox peckers. All right, let's go back to the leopards. I'm not sure how long Jamie's going to be able to be there, so let's head back there and maximize on this incredible sighting of those potentially five cats. Guys, we are going to have to leave this incredible sighting. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. Tingana's about to lose this impala. He's going to try and hoist it back up, but he is very, very close to dropping it down to the base of the tree. Now all that we're doing is we're simply waiting for the next person who would like to approach the sighting to get here and then we shall pull out and move off. Just gonna wait for a few moments. What an incredible way to spend an afternoon. Oh dangling by a thread. Oh it's gonna go, it's gonna go. Slipping, slipping. <laughs> the anticipation is killing me. And just in case those of you are terribly concerned about the dynamics of our two female cheetah, our cheetah, leopard, sorry, getting my animals confused. We're going to keep watching Tingana, but I'll just give you a brief update. Karula is fast asleep, and Shadow is watching Tingana's lack of skill with a somewhat jaded expression upon her face. But let's not tear our eyes away from Tingana just yet because I think he's about to have a disastrous moment. <laughs> he's in the most precarious position. He's trying to balance his weight on his back feet on the branch and then tuck his front of his body around to keep the impala where it is. And it's all gone terribly, terribly wrong for Mr. T. Well, or terribly right, I suppose. A couple of hours ago, he was simply occupying his time with Shadow, or attempting to avoid her attentions by pretending to sleep. Now, he's got a free meal. Out of the whole deal. Oh, Karula's growling again, but sleeping. Okay, guys, that's it. We have to go. Thanks for stations. I'm going to be pulling out of the sighting. Okay. Well, what an incredible afternoon it has been spent with these leopards. We're going to move off and find some other things. But in the meantime, I'm going to send you back across to James while I make my way out of this particular sighting. So we've come along now along the Gauri cut line, which is between the dam over there and, well, this magnificent river that runs through the middle of the reserve, the Mluamati drainage line. And rather hoping that those lions might have popped across here. In front of us is Aubrey, and Aubrey went to check the kill site, and I thought they might leave there, and they have indeed left there. I suspect, oh, there's an elephant. I suspect that they are in some very deep bush. It's not possible to kind of drive into this area with any degree of comfort. So we'll stop here and have a look at the elephant, and we'll also make sure that we can't see tracks of these lions going towards the pan there. We move a bit forward. And there we have l'elephant. And I'm sure there's a whole herd of them in here. On his own there. I don't know why he's on his own. He 
there could be another herd somewhere around close by. One or two more. Might just be a lonely fellow. Lonely bachelor finding his way in the world. Like me, Jandre. He's probably younger than me, though. Anyway, we'll sit here for a little while and enjoy him, see if we can maybe hear some alarm calling. That would indicate where the lions have gone. But the fact that Aubrey has driven up and down this road and checked for tracks indicates to me that they have not crossed towards the pan, and they're probably still in that hellishly thick block towards which that elephant is now facing. There he goes. Ah, hey, I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the Hello, everybody. Hi. Which channel on, is this? Oh, well, you and therefore I, well, I and now you, of course, we're on uh, wildsafarilive.com. Yes, but those are not on, on not TV. Not on TV now, no. We do do broadcasts to the United States, though, oh, okay. on National Geographic. No, not here. Yeah, it's a different region. It's all rather complicated. Enjoy. We are live. So you are live. You are live. You are live. Yeah. Would you like to say anything? Yes, somebody might spot you. We can't put it on you because you haven't signed a release form. You see, and you might sue us should you become famous overnight. <laughs> Oh, you never know. You never know. Stranger things have happened. <laughs> All right, we're going to carry on looking for these lions. Where do you think they went, Orbs? They're still inside there. Yeah. Okay. Lots of vultures and things. Okay. All right, everybody, we'll carry on north. Enjoy. Bye-bye. It's always slightly awkward when that happens, isn't it? Because you can't put the camera on them, but they always are fascinated by the sight of the camera. It could also be the sight of Andre's hairstyle and his enormous calves that arrest their attention. Regardless, you have to have some kind of a conversation, and then I feel a little disconnected from you guys, so I do apologize for any of that. But we had to have a polite conversation with those people, none of them under the age of 106. Hey, Andre. <laughs> Chandra is having a bit of a laugh. Very sweet. <laughs> right, let's carry on around the corner here. Another group of people, but I think we'll just bypass them. Aye! <laughs> we just go past them, rather not uh, stop and have another chat. <laughs> Righty. Gracie, aged nine, you say, are you still my best friend now that you're aged nine? Gracie, I don't know why you think it would ever have changed the fact that you are now aged nine. You're of course my best friend and shall remain so. No, Jean Ray, you're not my best friend. I'm, you're probably in the top 150 or so, but mm, yeah, Gracie is number one. I think I know 150 people. You're somewhere around there, maybe 148 or 149. <laughs> well, you know, there we are. Okay, we're going to head around towards, I think, I'm not sure if anyone's checked bubbles or dam. They may have headed that way, and then we'll come back to this area. I might try a little foray up that drainage line. It won't be easy. How was that leopard sighting? I hope you all enjoyed it. I was extremely jealous of the fact that uh, we didn't stay with those leopards for slightly longer. I just had a feeling maybe we should have, and then we thought, nah, let's go and look for the lions. And then if we'd stayed with them and followed them, well, we could have joined you there. But I believe there's something of a 
vehicle pileup going on around there, so maybe best that we didn't go there. Heading north to the Beevil's Hook cut line now. And we'll see what we can see there. Oh, sorry, Haley, I missed your question because of those people came up and we were greeting them. Um, the Centurions, we'll call it the Centurion vehicle. Uh, Haley, you say, how come the seasons are different from what they are in England? Uh, you say the winter is wet there and the summer is dry and it's the other way around here, of course. The summer is wet here, well, wettish, and the winter is dry. Well, Haley, first of all, I'm amazed that you say it's ever dry in England because that certainly hasn't been my experience, um, but, <laughs> but I take your point. Um, Haley, I, I, I'm not sure of the exact physical properties, but this is just a very strictly summer rainfall area. As you move to the south towards Cape Town, where Jean-Dre is from, uh, they have... Hmm? Heaven, says Jean-Dre. Jean-Dre, of course, is deluded. Uh, they have what we call a Mediterranean climate, and that's very because it's Mediterranean. So around the Mediterranean Sea and down to Cape Town, you have that winter rainfall and then very hot, dry summers. And I suppose that's much the same as it is in many parts of Europe. And that's just a Mediterranean climate down here. I think possibly because of the latitude, because we're closer to the equator, uh, we generally get our rain in the summertime. But I can't really say why. I'm going to have. I'm going to say it's because of our latitude, but I couldn't really tell you what physical properties of the atmosphere uh, make it so that because we're closer to the e equator, I'm not really sure. Very nice question. I love those questions that I can't really answer because, well, it's just rather interesting. Well, on that note, yesterday evening someone asked us about the Grant's uh, zebra, and I said I'd heard of it, but I wasn't really sure what it was. And then I opened my book and I said that there was an East African species, uh, well, subspecies of the plain zebra called Equus quacha bohemi. And that bohemi, thanks to my dear source of information, Judy H., is in fact the Grant's zebra. So thank you for that again, Judy H. Uh, your constant monitoring of my biological knowledge is enormously appreciated, so please keep doing it. So the Grant Zebra, everybody, for those of you who were listening yesterday evening, uh, is found in the Mara Triangle. So we were looking at them just, well, Monday to this week we were looking at the Grant Zebra in the Mara Triangle of Kenya. Now let's just see anything pops out. All right, while we're driving around here, seeing if we can find any sign of those lions, let's go back to Jamie and find out if she's going to n perhaps a nine leopard sighting. That was the record that I've ever heard of. I wasn't in it, but maybe Jamie can top that five leopard sighting. Let's go and find out. And after that incredible sighting, Dave and myself are just trundling along digesting how good our luck has been over the last few days and particularly this afternoon. We're so incredibly lucky with these live safaris because we get to witness these intimate moments between the different leopard characters. Stuff that some people only get to see once in a lifetime, if that. And it's in a way it gives us a much deeper understanding of the way in which the different leopards interact with each other, probably on a more frequent basis than we realize. So it's not the first time that we've seen Karula and is sort of involved with a mating pair, been around a mating pair, and I think that might be a first with her two cubs involved as well. And what was so fascinating about the build-up to that sighting, before we realized that Tangana was on his way, bringing Shadow trailing behind naturally, before we realized, I said to Dave, she's starting to chuff, she's starting to call, and then we saw the one cub, and then all of a sudden it was absolute chaos, and she was up going back to the kill, going to greet Tingana and investigate him. And it just turned out to be the most interesting interplay of the different dynamics. So a truly spectacular sighting here on the Sunset Safari. I'm not sure we can top that one, but you never know. The night is, or the evening is yet young, and we've still got at least another hour of our Sunset Safari. Well, let's see what other magical things we could find out here in the African bush. Our animals have been the stars of the show of late. They've been absolutely incredible. I think I'd 
I came this way for a reason. Oh, I remember. Apparently there was a male lion somewhere here, so I thought we'd go and just have a little scratch around for him. See if we can't add to our big cat total for this afternoon. I'll be more than happy with whatever it is we happen to encounter. And speaking of all animals, great and small and magical, James has encountered another giraffe. Let's go across to him. There is a giraffe, everybody. Obviously. Now, what's interesting about this giraffe, and it's going to be difficult to see for you because of the, the way the light is distributed, but he is very, very dark. And the question is oft asked of us, is a giraffe's darkness an indication of his age? And you know, a lot of the time it really isn't. A lot of the time it's simply an indicator of a, you know, a giraffe with slightly darker hair. And this chap's just got quite dark hair. I think he's younger than the one we saw earlier. And I think that because he's got, well, I actually don't. He's much bigger than the one we saw earlier. He is he's probably older. He's got quite a lot in the way of that parafilarial parasite on his neck, which you can't see in the silhouette, but you can see the median horn there. You can see the calcification of the skull that's taken place. And also his eyelashes sticking out there. <laughs> that's quite cool. Well done, Jandre. You've captured his eyelashes beautifully. You know, I learned the other day, everybody, a completely useless fact that will not help you or me, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Elizabeth Taylor had a very rare condition where she had um, eyelashes on the top and the bottom, which apparently is very unusual. I know you've, we've all got very sort of small ones on the bottom, but she had basically a double top and bottom. It's a rare genetic condition, and that's why her eyes looked so, well, so interesting. Um, I don't remember. I don't really remember Elizabeth Taylor uh, too well, but I thought I would share that utterly useless fact with you on account of the fact that it's the only uh, eyelash fact that I'm aware of. Rusty is now revving horribly. Let's let her clutch go. Uh, let me put it in high range. Maybe that'll help. Now we're on Hyena Road. The lions were in about here. Aubrey's gone in to have a look. He has driven this road already. So I don't know that they are around here. And if they haven't crossed this road, then they won't have gone towards Beefle's Hook Dam. And we don't have too long left before the sunset, in which case we won't keep looking for the cubs. But what I think we're going to do is drive around on Hyena Road. If there's nothing here, I'm going to actually put my nose into the drainage line and see if we can't drive up there. And that might be quite nice to find them lying in the dappled shade of a Tambuti Grove. Would that not be nice, Andre? Would it fill you with joy? Now, I know one of the viewers has been wondering uh, if they could see Andre's calves. And um, he's shaking his head, of course. Come on, Andre, show us your calves. They are very impressive. Chai Town Connie, do you want to see Andre's calves? You haven't shaved. Okay, well, never mind. What I'll do is take a picture of them. <laughs> He's now trying to hide everybody. He's trying to get out of the car so that we can... I got them. <laughs> there goes my lens cap. Hold on one second. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you what, if you look at my calves, both together like that, that's what Jandre's, that's what each of his look like. But they don't have any hair on them. Well, they have actually. It's just a little bit sparser than mine. Right, there we are. That's ridiculous, John. It's a serious wildlife show. I think I may have broken this camera. <laughs> uh, 
Hello, Daniel and Virginia. You say, while jean was on leave, did he see, um, did he see Graham's camera work in Kenya? He did. And he was very complimentary about it, weren't you, jean -Dre? You said it was the best you'd ever seen. Yes. yes. <laughs> Let me explain something about Graham Wallington, everybody. He's, he's got, he refuses to wear, I mean, his eyes are, well, his eyes are losing flexibility, as it, that happens to all of us. But he refuses to wear bifocals. So he's got two pairs of glasses, one of which helps him to see far, and one of which helps him to see close. But if you are filming from a camera, you need to be able to see the viewfinder and the subject that you're filming. So he was basically, it's impossible to see, for him to see, because he won't wear bifocal glasses, it's impossible for him to see what he's filming at if he wants to see the viewfinder in focus, and likewise, if he wants to see the viewfinder in focus, he cannot see what he's actually filming. So it's very difficult for him because he refuses to wear these, uh, to wear the bifocal glasses. And that's why he was rather uncomplimentary to himself about his film work. I thought he did remarkably well. He certainly did far better than I would have. But that's not saying much. It would definitely have been a blurry Mara if I'd been on camera. All right. Let's go across to Jimmy. She's in the Mluamati drainage. I will try and take some pictures of jean -Dre's legs. <laughs> and James's mom says he only takes pictures of the sun. Anyway, moving on, since we're in the Mulwati drainage line, Dave, I'm not going to take any pictures of your calves, I'm sorry. Thanks, and But I, I take a strong stance against um, uh, objectifying Dave and the other cameraman. But as we trundle along the Mulwati, I've just spoken to Ephraim, who tells me that where he left the male lion this morning, there are lots and lots and lots of elephant tracks, and that it's most likely that they chased him somewhere into this vicinity. Now, that's what we're looking for at the moment. Either way, I think that the Juma Dam pan is going to be a very good place to start heading towards as it starts to get dark because there's a chance the Nkuhumas are going to come for a drink, there's a chance that the male lion is going to come across for a drink, and who knows what other things might decide to come and quench their thirst. And either way, driving through the Mulwati is a truly scenic route that we can just sit back and enjoy. And in fact, I don't even have to really drive the car, it kind of drives itself. It really is the most relaxing way to go about one's afternoon safari, the equivalent of a river cruise, Looking up at the beautiful Tambuerti, perhaps looking up to see a lion. I say hopefully, whoops, I say you don't need to drive. The odd handle on the steering wheel would be a good idea. Truly picturesque and atmospheric. And hopefully with a male lion somewhere along the road. Okay. Welcome to okay. Stacy. It's lovely to have you on board. Stacy is one of our newer viewers and has asked a question that we always love answering. We always love encouraging people to pursue the dreams that they have. So Stacy would like to know how we came to work in the bush and do the career that we do working in a in a game reserve. And the answer is each of us has a very different path. I kind of always knew I really wanted to do this. I wanted to be a wildlife vet, but I'm excruciatingly allergic to animals, which unfortunately paid to that particular career path. I then did an unsuccessful foray into law, with a couple of um, trips to reserves in between and working on reserves in between. As you can see, my legal career has been sterling, so far, most successful. And then I went on to pursue my dream of becoming a safari guide and work out here. But I've known since I was a very small child. It feels like as long as I can remember. It's probably not that long. But one of my earliest memories is watching a lion walk past the car in the Kruger National Park. And we've got all kinds of wonderful stories. I mean, Brent has the most unique, probably, in terms of backgrounds, in that he essentially grew up on a game reserve from when he was a very, very small child. And James has had a different path. We all but it is something worth pursuing. There's lots of different routes, there's lots of different ways, and there's lots of different reasons to do it.
And essentially, you, there are qualifications, there are official qualifications that you have to follow as we duck beneath the beautiful archway of the Mulwati drainage. There are certain qualifications to be government qualifications doing a set of exams that include a theoretical and practical component. And then from there, you can advance your knowledge as you go along. But you're right, it is an incredible career, and if you are interested in hearing any more, you are more than welcome to send through any questions that you have to the final control on questions at wildearth.tv or to hashtag Safari Live. And if you're really, really keen on pursuing a career in the guiding industry, then we're more than happy to help you in whatever way that we can. I wake up every day and am grateful that I get to do what I do. There's not many people that get to live out their dreams, and we've been very lucky that we've been able to do it. Come on, lion. It's not a lion, but there's something moving there. I'm sure of it. It is a monkey. Huh. And it's just gone away into that... Oh, um, goodness. Marie, let me see if I can try and find him again for you. We haven't, I feel like I haven't seen vervet monkeys yet since I've come back from leave. You got him. Bravo, Dave. Well done. You've definitely got him. That's definitely a monkey. <laughs> I think he's trying to work out if it's been spotted or not. Where's the rest of your buddies, little one? Oh, there we go. Little peeking out on the side on the right. There's two of them there in shot. Can you spot the second one? There it is, shifting around. Oh, bounce, bounce, bounce. Have we gone up into the leadwood? Of course, the jackalberry trees are fruiting at the moment, which means that we've got lots of different animals around the Mulwati drainage. And right now, playing peekaboo with a troop of vervet monkeys in my one of my top five trees. A leadwood tree. It looks dwarfed by this giant of the tree world. Perfectly at home. Ascending with ascending with the grace that perhaps Tingana did not quite show when attempting to get to that kill. All right, let us go over to James and see what creature he's found for you this time. We have found, everybody, a buffalo, again. Very nice buffalo there, grazing, obviously, that's what they do. And we're not too far from the setting sun. I don't mean that physically, we're obviously very far from the setting sun. <laughs> Some eight million kilometers, I believe, in fact, even more than that. But it's just quite nice watching the dust rising off their feet and that dust, of course, a sign of the dry season. This is the best light to view buffalo in, everybody. I just find that they are slightly sort of, um, I don't know, dull in the middle of the day. But when it comes to now and they're kicking up dust and the light is shining through their fur, I think they're quite attractive in the most uh, bovine way, I suppose. Jandre, have you ever described a human being as being bovine? It's not a compliment. No. no. Look at this one here, Jandre. I think he's itchy. <laughs> I think he's got an itch he rather needs to scratch. <laughs> Oh dear. Oh goodness. Yes. Uh, what, that jackalberry tree is going to be rather sad, I think. I feel that a, a tree as magnificent as a jackalberry should not be subjected to what that one is being subjected to at this point. <laughs> <laughs> 
Joaquin Nesby laughing at him. Stop laughing. Don't laugh. He's, look, he's feeling ashamed. Just let him walk off the tree. Go on. We're not watching. Okay. Look at him. He looks so ashamed. It's okay, Beefy. That's how it is for you. You don't have opposable hands. You can't. You don't have hands. You don't have claws. You have jackalberry trees. He looks absolutely bereft. Let's take the camera off him, Jean Ray. I think he's very nervous now. <laughs> okay, we're going to carry on around the corner. Um, I'm going to leave these buffalo and I want to drive up the drainage with you and just see if we can't find those lions before the sun goes down. We're not far from there. I don't know if we're going to be able to do it, but let's see. Yeah, well, this is a very good, good point from you. Hello, my friend. Yes, you're very close by. Yes, I'm sorely tempted to slap you on the bottom, but I'm not going to. Don't worry. He is now within touching distance. Yes, we'll leave you to it, as you were. <laughs> uh, Liz, very good point. You say you wonder if there won't be another buffalo kill in this vicinity tonight. It's easily possible. Remember, there was a male with them. There's another male not too far behind. Five lionesses, buffalo all over here, so it's not impossible at all that they would kill again. The only thing is, will they uh, be prepared to put the effort in? I'm not so sure. There's some impalas just crossing the road. So if they've had a whole big buffalo to eat, would they go for it again? Uh, if their blood got up and they got close enough, yes, then maybe. But I'm not sure how much movement there's going to be this evening. Right. We are now going down towards the slope and we'll head in and see what we can see. We really have had the most amazing day here, haven't we? Cats all over the place. Lions, leopards everywhere. Now, I'm going to drive in here. Um, probably, actually, not quite from here. So we're going to drive up this drainage. We're going to go a little bit further along to where that big jackalberry is. And we're going to drive up from there. Basically, where we saw Tingana come out of the drainage yesterday, we're going to go up the way from there. And the light is now just too special. Now would be a good time to take a picture of your calves, jean -Dre, because the light is very beautiful. The aerial is, I'm afraid, having a relax. I don't think it's supposed to be pointing at the ground. Now, Tinganana popped out of the drainage just over here yesterday. And it is from here that we're going to drive up the drainage line to the lions. I'm 99% sure that they are just in a place where Aubrey couldn't get that enormous land cruiser that he was driving. And I'm pretty sure that we can get this little thing in. Right here. Here we go. We may, of course, be stopped by the, uh, well, the sort of difficulties of moving through very bush-infested area. This is the peninsula that Brian and I lodged ourselves on yesterday. So the lions are not far from here, just a couple hundred meters, I imagine, 300 or so feet. And we're not going to get through that area, that way. Try here. <laughs> hello, Lauren. Or oh, Lawrence. Was it Lauren or Lawrence? Lawrence. Lawrence, hello. You say 
apart from the live safaris, what do we do in the park? Well, we don't do anything. Um, we don't do any, that's what we do permanently, but in the park, there is obviously a lot of tourism, huge amount of tourism activity that goes on here, which is great fun. You can come and stay at some amazing places and see this incredible wildlife. Otherwise, the other job that you can do around here would be that of a, a ranger. And the rangers are the guys in charge of the actual conservation work. They will do the anti-poaching, they'll burn the fire breaks, maintain the roads, look after animals, um, maintain populations at the right numbers in some areas. And that's basically what you can do. We don't do too much of that. In fact, we don't do any of that. We are purely uh, here for the live safaris. And we like to think we make a contribution to conservation by introducing people to the wilderness and to the wild. Now, these lions, I think, are really pretty close by to where we are now. But whether we can get in there or not, I don't know. Maybe a little bit of bump here, bump here, Andre. Yes, I know you'll be our rig. Watch out for this tambuti tree, Andre. Don't eat the leaves, you'll die. And I shall have to film myself. Are you all right there? And we all know that we don't want me filming myself, Chandra. Now, this is a slight shot in the dark, and I'm hoping we'll be lucky. You seen any lions, Chandra? You smell scat. Well, that is a good sign. It may have been a scat that I drove over this afternoon, this morning. All right, now, the thing with the pride of lions that has cubs is that the cubs at this time of the day will start making a noise. So let's have a listen. That's an alarm calling bird. Listening for that. But there is definitely a distinctive smell of lion dung in the area. And the sounds of elephants breaking things. Now, I'm not convinced that we can go forward here and make it up. Let's try. Andre, we will have to watch your head on this thing. We'll gently ease our way forward here. Oh! The lions are not here, everybody, and you know why I know that? It's because I'm psychic. No, it's not. It's because they are at the Juma Pan, and you've told us that. How we missed their tracks going across the road, I cannot imagine, unless, of course, they've just crossed now, which is very possible. Right, because I don't, I'd happily believe that I'd missed them. I wouldn't believe that Aubrey'd missed them, though. Okay, let's go to the Juma Pan and see the lions. Unless Jamie's closer, in which case she can go there. But I think, I think we are closer actually. We'll just pop out here. Hold on, Jandre. Hold on, Jandre. I think we're going to make it. I think we are. I'm just going to call it in on the radio, just in case some of the game drives who are looking for them are closer by. Stations, a visual of the Nkuhuma Pride at the pan. Uh, it's visual on the damn pan camera. I'm not there yet, so I'm up my way there. I'll be two minutes away. Right, hold on. We're two minutes out. And the cubs are there. Thank you, everybody. Jandre, your aerial's having a rest.
Come on, come on, come on. We've just got to get around this corner. The last time we saw a lion, the Juma Pan, everybody, we missed because she disappeared into the bushes. Oh, and there are elephants there as well. Thank you, everyone, for watching on the Juma Dam cam. Kirsten, you don't have a feed there, do you? Okay, Kirsten doesn't have a picture yet. This is because we're in the new final control and it's just taking a little bit of time to put it together. Right, here we are. We have now a reved. Oh, and there is a game drive there already. I'm going to go down into the dam, Andre. Unless we go onto the... Well, let's go around this way. There they go. The males there as well. This is fantastic. Look at all the elephants. This is amazing. Look there, all the lions on the right hand side. Elephants off to the front. Unbelievable. Kirsten, if you want to try, I don't know what your no, you in fact don't go to the the, you know, the camera's facing away, I think, from the pan. More elephants coming up towards the pan. And I, oh, you don't so you can't actually cut it. Okay, I've got it. I've got you. I've lost my game drive radio now. Where on earth is it? There it is. Oh look, little cubs. Look at them all. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, they're too cute. Stations I'm not sure if anyone copied, but the Nkuma Pride is now mobile slowly in east from the dam. There's a very large herd of elephants in the water now. And the one big male who I think is courting amber eyes. Why wouldn't she? But he's not courting that lioness because she is unquestionably still nursing. You can see that from here. He's got a bit of a limp. Not unusual for a male lion or leopard to have a bit of a limp. And they've clearly been drinking. You can see them sniffing, and the reason they've moved away from the water, everybody, I'm 99% sure, is because of these elephants. You can see lots of them there now. They've totally covered the pan. And they know the lions are there, but the lions will not take a <coughs> chance. Andre, consumption. Now let's see what happens here. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be unusual Look at this. They're chasing the lions now. See how they're moving the cubs away? The lions. Here come the elephants. Shouting. The lions have taken fright. Oh, and look. This is our favorite elephant, everybody. That's the half-trunk herd. She doesn't book any nonsense, that elephant. She's one of our favorite characters for our new viewers. You can hear the little cubs, maybe they're just objecting them. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Look at them disappearing through the bush there. And the little black ears, you can see why they've got black ears now. Such an effective following mechanism. And I don't know if you can hear, but the elephants are all talking to each other. They're making that low, deep rumble. I don't think you'll pick it up. It's very low frequency. I think let's follow those lions, everyone. We're going to have a last view of them before the sun sets, and we might come back to the elephants just now. Have we 
knocked a game drive aerial off. Sorry, Kirsten, I'm having trouble with the radios here. Here we go. I think that they are... Yes, we got you now. They're the little cubs. And the mum is over there. We're going to go just towards the cubs. I think they're going to go back towards where that kill is. I don't know that they're going to go all the way there. But I think they'll go towards it and perhaps spend the night in the drainage line area where we were. Look at them all. I'm not going to follow them through that thick block, everyone. So let's just enjoy them now. Look, just groaning and getting a little bit miserable, not having to walk around. Uh, Jen Ward, you say, an exciting drive for both James and Jamie. Absolutely, just incredible stuff. We've had an unbelievable day. We really have. And then playing with each other. Martha, you want to know if lions eat elephants? They do. Very, very seldom do they eat them here. Normally only if they actually die. Uh, of natural causes, I mean. Uh, but in Botswana, and in the drought season, and during those sorts of times, then absolutely they do. But normally the elephant has to be very, very weak, and the pride has to be very, very large in order for them to be killed. That is a very large male lion. Well, he's relatively large. He's not actually very large. He's just an impressive beast, isn't he? These Birmingham boys have filled out a huge amount in the last sort of year that they've been in charge here. Just over a year now they've been in charge. Look at that golden light catching him there. And I'm not going to follow them through there, everybody. The sun is setting, the cubs are going back, and it's just, it's very thick in there. Stations, these animals have moved, the pride has moved off east into the block towards uh, the Gari cut line. I'm not going to follow them through the block, it's very thick. I think let's just go, let's have one last look there. They may well pop out on the Gari cut line. There we go. Just uh, spraying his territory there, making sure everybody knows who's in charge. And let's just have a listen. You can hear him sneezing. You can hear them contact calling. The odd whining noise from the little cubs as they walk. And then, of course, the alarm call of a white-browed scrub robin going... Right, let's go and have a look at the elephants, I think. They're starting to move off now. Andre, this car is not sounding good. Oh. Hello, fox hat. You say elephants, lions, cubs, elephants, gold. Oh, you say, I already said elephants. Golden light doesn't get much better. It certainly doesn't. It's just stunning. And they'll still smell those lions, you know. Let's go up onto the wall here. Hold on, John Ray. Don't fall out the car. Grip on with those amazing calves of yours. <laughs> there we are. 
Last station, best approach, just pop up the Gauri cut line. I'm pretty sure they're going to pop out there in the next three minutes or so. Isn't that gorgeous? Look at the dust on them. Oh, it really is stunning. Now this, I think, will be two or three herds of elephants. We definitely know that the half-trunk herd, or third-trunk herd, if you like, let's call it the short-trunk herd. And we don't have to uh, argue with amongst ourselves as to the exact fraction of the trunk that is missing, because it's not, it's more, she's got more than a half. So let's call it the short-trunk herd, just four of them. And there might be two herds here as well congregating in the water and then splitting up again. And just the little bits of subtle colour, the last bits of winter leaf. Lovely to see. Mm. Jandre, do you see that animal over there? That one there, look at that everyone, it's a great migration. That is the blue wildebeest of which I saw quite a few in the last week or so. And the difference being, for those of you watching our little Mara broadcast, this chap has got a black beard and not a white one. And his horns are actually, as Peter Bart pointed out to me, his horns are actually closer to his head than the brindled gnu of East Africa. Very nice. 1.5 million of those things knocking about in East Africa. Let's just go around the corner here. We'll get a last look at these elephants. Thank you all for your screenshots. Very nice. I don't think we're going to get them backlit against this light, so we'll just get them sort of lit to the side, if that's all right, Jandre. Is that okay? There you are. Is that any good to you? Good. <laughs> and here you'll see the herd split out slowly drift apart from each other in the dying embers of the day. You can see many of these trees have already been savaged by elephants at various times. eating that peltiforum bush, the same tree that the buffalo were eating. And Jandre wing approached a little bit by a young bull here. Oh, except the, <laughs> that one, of course, using his brother as a plate. Very nice. Hello Nicole in Canada, you're wondering about the short trunk herd and how it is that that young elephant managed to lose the piece of her trunk. Nicole, it's most likely, I hate to say it, because of a snare. It's quite possible that it was a poacher's snare. Huge amount of poverty and hungriness on the western fringes of the Kruger Park. And lots of people, well not lots, there are a few people that set snares for the pot to try and catch something like an impala to eat and sometimes elephants get caught up in that sort of activity and their trunks get caught in the snares and eventually they fall off and I suspect that's what happened there. It's possible that it was a crocodile when she was very young but it's most likely I think that it was a snare.
She manages fine, you know, it really is amazing how easily she manages. They're having a drink now at the waterhole, the short chunk curd. And this chap just trying out his newfound coordination with his trunk. It's not a wrinkly bottom, is it? No, I don't think it is. He would be about that size now. But I don't think his bottom is quite as wrinkly as wrinkly bottom's bottom. You think his bottom is quite as wrinkly as wrinkly bottom's bottom? Jean-André? No, I don't either. Mmm. Enjoying the delicious flavours of Peltoforum Africanum. Oh, you're vicious. He's just telling us that he's very strong and I'm not to talk to him in anything other than the most adult of terms. Hello, Kevin, Kevin. Um, you want to know where the elephants get the water? Well, I'll take you down to it now. There's a little water hole here that's pumped, and so we're actually driving along a pipeline here, and it's pumped from a, a well or borehole down to the south, not too far from where the, the leopard is, actually, and it's pumped towards here. Let's just stop here and let them go past us. I don't want to make them upset. You can see covered in mud. And apparently, if you have got a feed of the nest cam going, you're going to get an unbelievable picture of those elephants walking all around it. The nest cam is actually in the water hole. So if you can look at it, I would do, I'm not sure actually you find it, you find it on wildearth.tv, I think you'll find the nest cam. <laughs> That's the one following mum. Oh, apparently it's not, it's on a place called nest.com, you can probably search Juma or Wild Earth there and you'll get the picture of that nest cam. I should know that. I'm sorry I don't. Jandri, let's just go up to the waterhole here quickly for our last bit of light. And Kathy, you say you'd love to see Benjamin Button. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, Benjamin Button, an elephant that looks like he's got very old before his age and in a similar way, Wrinkly Bottom has a very wrinkly bottom. Both about the same age. Benjamin's probably a bit younger. I too would like to see them. I'm just going to pull off the road here slightly so that you can see the elephants and the wildebeest drinking together and I'm also going to ask jean to show you where the nest cam is. There is the nest cam. You can see it, just that little bobble hanging below the... Oh, I knew he was going to do that. He's just stepped in front of it. So if you're watching the nest cam now, you'll get an incredible view of that elephant. There you can see it. There it is. <laughs> So you can imagine the view you'd get of those elephants from there and I'm sure Connor and Peter Bratt who have set up the nest cam at great effort are going to be terrified of whether or not those elephants are going to push it over. And Peter was apparently in a blind panic earlier about it. Now there is the short tail, short trunked cow, the short trunk matriarch. There's lots of mud there that she's now sucking off her, <laughs> sucking off her trunk. And she's not old, I think she's only about 25 years old, you know. Right, great news everybody. 
Jamie had to leave, but Jamie has gone back. She's with those incredible leopards. Let's go and have a look. There's... We've got an extraordinary sighting playing out once again in front of us. Tingana has managed to keep his impala right up at the top of the tree. I say his impala, Karula's impala, right at the top of the tree in a certain piece has descended upon our three adult leopards all involved in this particular sighting. So Tingana has found a very uncomfortable position. Shadow is at the base of the tree looking restless and upset and unsettled. There she is there, lying down, stretched out. She's been up and down and up and down and up and down. And then of course the poor leopard that was responsible for this particular kill, the lovely Queen Karula, is growling away over there. Just a pile of spots and a disgruntled expression. Knows that she's lost her kill, but not ready to leave just yet. As for where her cubs are, I imagine they are safe and sound somewhere further into the block, so into the vegetation, away from any risky business that might be happening here. I don't think that there's any serious threat to their safety at all. It's just been an interesting day for them, and unfortunately for them, mealtime is probably over. I think that the smell of the carcass was what attracted Tingana, and in turn, he brought Shadow with him. Tingana's making me chuckle a little bit. He's so determined to keep that kill to himself that he's gonna stay in the tree. Even though he's eaten plenty, so he's going to stay in the tree, but he really, really is not comfortable. One little bit. He is dangling. <laughs> I don't even know how he can begin to sleep like that. And there we go to for Smiley in the UK. Smiley wants to know whether or not leopards ever fall out of the tree and if they ever die as a result. Yes, they fall out of trees and they get a very, I think personally, they get a very embarrassed expression on their faces and very sort of abashed body language. Not something you often see though, they're very good at saving themselves. The number of deaths recorded from leopards falling out of trees is exceptionally rare. So like your house cats at home, they have a tremendous ability to land on their feet and to absorb that landing with their incredibly springy joints. So it's very, very unusual for a leopard to fall out of a tree. They're very good at staying in them. Lions, on the other hand, very often fall out of trees. They definitely cannot compete with the leopards in terms of their tree climbing ability. And Tingana really does. I mean, how on earth he's managing to make that look so peaceful, I really, really don't know. sort of perching precariously and we kind of reached a stalemate after the excitement of the afternoon none of the leopards are in any hurry to move Tingana is going to guard that kill until he's finished I mean he's basically finished it there's hardly anything left from what I can <laughs> see is that not comfortable at all mister <laughs> I'm going to scoot forward a little bit <laughs> so I can try and get you a better view. We are in a very precarious, in a very precarious spot, but I just wanted to stop here so I could show you all three leopards. But let me go forward a little bit so you can see exactly how silly Tingana really looks. We're in a bit of a, an incline on a termite mound here. I have to laugh at him. He's so determined that that killer is going to stay his and that none of the other leopards have a chance to feed on it that he's found himself in a really, truly uncomfortable pose. Dave, if I stop there, can you sort of... Perfect, thank you. As you can see, we are truly precarious right now, but not quite as precarious as Tingana. <laughs> is absolutely hilarious. That really cannot be comfortable, mister. <laughs> I 
And of course, as it does start to get dark, we will leave the sighting. We don't know where Karula's cubs are, and we don't want to run the risk of attracting any unwanted attention. She's already had enough to deal with today. So we won't be putting spotlights on them, even though the kill is up on the tree, we don't know where Karula's little ones are. But I don't think she would be as relaxed as she is. Sorry, I'm distracted. She's just lifted her head. I'm going to keep watching her. She's very well hidden there. I don't know. There you go. You can just make her out. I thought perhaps she was glancing across at the cubs. There is a chance that they might come and investigate what's going on, but it's relatively unlikely. Leopard cubs have an uncanny knack, especially Karula's it appears, for keeping themselves out of trouble and out of harm's way. I think she's just making sure that they don't make their way back here. Poor Karula. And Chris has said this has been the best soap opera that they have ever seen. Yes, absolutely, I couldn't have described it better myself. The days of our lives of our leopards, or something similar. I could have been a bit more creative there, but that was the first thing that popped into mind. You know, sands through the hourglass, or at least sands through the African savanna. But yes, a true soap opera has played out. With the victor being the big male leopard, well, he's got the food at least. Perhaps not the comfort, but he's definitely got the food. A truly amazing way to spend one's afternoon. While we do one more shuffle around and just see if we've got any chance to improve our view, let's jump across to James, who has a hippo at Juma Dam. Much better view there of the hippopotamus. Everybody may well come down and sit in the water during the course of the night or certainly have a drink. Not much for him to eat around here, so I'm not really sure what he's thinking about eating. But I just think that's a really lovely picture, don't you? It's just rather gorgeous. He's sitting there. It looks like he's resting his nose on the ground. I think he's having a snooze with his nose on the ground there. Doesn't look too troubled by life, does he? Certainly much less so than those leopards. Gosh, what a day with them. Hello, Snoop. Do you think it's Snoop Dog? Andre? Do you think it's Snoop Dog asking us a question? Snoop, um, you want to know how far the uh, hippo has to go? Stop shaking. Do you think that how far the hippo has to go to eat? In this case, quite far. Um, I would imagine probably during the course of the night that hippo could easily move 15 kilometers or so, 16 kilometers, maybe 10 miles. Yeah, I think that's probably how far you'd have to go to find sufficient to eat. Remember, hippo, because of their energy balance, remember they spend most of their time in the water. And that means that they don't have to eat some, as much as something like a rhino does, which has to walk around all day. So they don't have enormous energy needs but they do obviously need to eat. Now over this side there is a herd of elephants approaching us. I don't really want to drive towards them because I think they're coming up towards the pan and so let's just enjoy the sight of them in this sort of light. Isn't that nice? That's very beautiful John. Is that to do with you or to do with the sort of natural light? Me, yes. You mean my my radiance is so bright that it is shining upon them, Absolutely. casting them in a gorgeous light. Ooh, the back one there, can you see there, has got a collar on her. You see that bob, bobble on the back of her head? That is a collar, which means she's being used for some kind of research. There'll be a GPS tracker on there, much the same as the one on Cindilla, the male leopard. And I find for elephants it's even more interesting than it is for leopards because they move massive dis distances. Far more than any other animal I know other than maybe wild dogs, but I think even them, they don't move as far as these elephants do. Hmm? Birds. Birds. 
Yes, birds move as far as elephant, elephants do. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jean-Dre. Now be quiet. <laughs> Smart ass. Now, the reason I'm not moving is I think that's a nice picture and they're coming up to drink and I don't want to really disturb them. I'm rather hoping they'll come past us, but whether they'll do that in time before we have to close the show, I'm not sure. So we'll just enjoy them for now. The Nest Cam, by the way, is unfortunately now without power. So Peter Bart was down here trying to fix it, but unfortunately he's only going to be able to fix it tomorrow. I'm slowly ambling up here. And I've said to you before, if you look at the one on the left there, hips sticking out, spine sticking out. They have struggled this dry season and they will continue to struggle until the first flushes of longish grass start to grow. I guess also, you know, some of the trees, the knob thorns will start to flush immediately. They flush according to day length rather than the amount of rain that there is. And so that will be a help to these elephants. And they have struggled because they didn't have much grass last wet season. You can see that collar there. Looks like a necklace, doesn't it, Jandre? Hmm. And now they're just having a little bit of a play. All right, everybody, that's going to be it from us. Thank you, Jandre, and thank you, everyone, for watching. We're going to head it back across to Jamie for the last part of the show. She's looking at leopards and hyena. We'll see you in the morning. As if the soap opera couldn't get any more dramatic, look who has turned up to scout the scene. A hyena at the base of the marula tree and a shadow lying right in front of it, which we often see with leopards and hyenas. The leopards generally know that they're faster than the hyena, they're more agile. So shadow's content to rest there as long as she knows the hyena's there. And the hyena most likely is more interested in, oh, there we go, those sorts of scraps than it is in attacking the leopard. But what an incredible way to finish off our sunset safari then with a second spotted creature. Two scavengers, one called Tingana and one a hyena. Look at the scene in front of you. Absolutely astounding. And our beard has been far more creative with his soap opera names. Days of our drives. I've forgotten all the rest of them, but it was sheer genius. Well done, our beard. <laughs> all my cubs like Sabi Sands through the hourglass. Perfect. I think that neatly sums up what has been another extraordinary live safari experience. Dave, we've just been on a roll, haven't we? absolutely incredible and all along the winner of this particular scenario rests if not comfortably then perhaps precariously on his marilla tree it is now obviously very very dark we will be leaving the sighting as soon as we finished off with our sunset safari wild dogs there's wild dogs in this sighting. I don't believe this. Run, Shadow, run, Shadow, run. I don't believe this. There's Karula there. This is absolutely phenomenal. We can't move just now. We need to give these leopards space. Run, 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 up. Good girl. This is absolutely astounding. Obviously, we're not going to finish the show right now. Garuda's made it safely up into the tree. Shadow has as well on the other side of the termite mound. This is incredible. Absolutely. Here comes the dog. Duck my head down. Where did you come from? No wonder the hyena belted away like it did. 
Come on, she had a cruel as cubs. I really hope are up somewhere nice and safe. I'm sure they are. Here comes the wild dog to see what's going on. Being watched carefully by Tingana, who of all of them has turned out to be the safest and most secure. No wonder that hyena went sprinting away. Uh, the most, the second most endangered carnivore in Africa just came belting onto the scene. Forget soap opera, this is, this is on a whole different level. Disappearing off into the dark. Obviously we have extended the drive. Life's very tricky for Dave right now, there's too many things to look at. And we are on a very awkward la sort of level. There go the dogs there. Just when we thought things couldn't get more dramatic, wild dogs have come racing onto the scene. There's the male. You can see it's him with his thick neck. And now they're jumping up at the tree where Karula is. But she's okay. She's going to be absolutely fine there. Let's stay looking at the Marula tree where they're jumping. There we go. Look at this. Look at this. Leaping up to try and reach for her. Then no chance there, doggies. Not a chance. Karula is far too canny for you, and if I know Karula like we do, she's got those cubs safe and sound somewhere as well. I know that you're all terribly worried about the cubs. That was my first thought as well. But they are going to be okay. I'm sure they're up in the tree already, particularly since hyena was lurking around. Here comes the wild dog behind us. My goodness gracious me. The most, one of the most extraordinary sightings. <laughs> I'm speechless. Apparently you guys are all speechless. I'm speechless too. I couldn't understand why that hyena sprinted like a mad creature all of a sudden. I thought for one crazy moment Karula had tried to chase it away. Here comes the... My goodness gracious me. I know it's getting very dark, but obviously for those of you who are joining us for the first time, in this situation we absolutely cannot put any lights on these animals. And in fact we're not going to move either until we've got a better idea of where it, all the players are. We're just going to sit here and let this moment sink in. I know you can just see a little bit. Unfortunately, it is getting too dark. This is as light as we can get everything. That was truly, truly astounding. <laughs> James Richards wants to know how long until the lions show up. James, hopefully not at all. Especially with our endangered wild dogs and our leopards everywhere, but I get your drift. Why don't we throw in a cheetah for good measure and just complete the astounding afternoon? And an artvark, why not? Let's have an artvark wander into the midst, because this has just really been momentous. A drive for the record books three different types of predators, big predators, five leopards, three wild dogs, one hyena, all playing out in one spectacular sighting. Racing around behind us. taken my breath away. And Sleepy One? Yes, what we're watching here is completely normal. We are in a very awkward position and I'm actually going to, in a moment, I'm going to ask Dave to turn the presenter light off my face, just because it's now got so dark that it's providing a little bit of extra ambient light. So Dave, if you don't mind, if you can just switch that off. Sorry guys, you can barely see me. We're sitting in the dark. 
but that is what we need to do because now it's got to the point where it's got so dark that we have to do that. So sleepy one, yes, it's totally normal for wild dogs to chase leopards. Sorry, I've got I'm trying to have eyes in the back of my head here. The reason they do it is it's a predator hierarchy and they actually come right up top. Depending on numbers, if they've got the advantage of numbers, they fall just below lions in terms of the hierarchical layout of the different predators. So they very, very often chase leopards up trees when they encounter them. Which is, of course, what has played out here. Shadow, I heard her growling. I think she's made it into a marula tree on the other side of the termite mound. Karula's accounted for. Tingana, of course, through all of this, is absolutely fine. The hyena's booked out of the sighting. And now it's just Karula's cubs. And unfortunately, we'll just have to wait for the sunrise safari to find out what happens. I think the wild dogs have decided they're bored and that it's time to clear off. They're going to be finding somewhere safe to settle down for the evening. Listen. The wild dogs have gone for now. It's time for us to remove ourselves from this particular situation and let the scenario play out however it is meant to play out. But I think it's safe to say that that is one afternoon for the record books. What an incredible surprise. Sure, Dave, I still can't believe it. It's totally speechless. I'm so glad you were all there with us to share in it. Well done to Dave and a big thank you as well as to the lovely Kirsty and Jerry in Final Control and to all of you. Join us on the Sunrise Safari and we'll try and puzzle together what happened during the night.